Right, this is another episode of Summoning Insight. This is the section where me and Monty talk while you, a delinquent with deranged ideas about society, exhibit disturbing trends in your parasocial relationship with us where we actually, even though it sounds like I'm talking to you, don't know you exist until you say something stupid on the internet, but you sit in chat asking, why are we talking on our own, checks notes, fucking talk show that we invented, (laughs) or... Why isn't the guest talking? Or even better, why isn't the guest here yet? Even though we have no obligation to do any of these things for you. In fact, you know what? If it wasn't for the fact it was rude to the guest, I'd just actually wait for one of the days where you all go hand doing that and just tell the guest, you know what? We'll do this another week. You can clear off me. It's just us for this one. And just fucking extend this motherfucker out seven hours or something. You know, don't even care. But no, it's your favourite show, Summoning Insight. And you know what? You're probably wondering, are oh, they back to the weekly shows? Yeah, because listen, we, we, we'll keep it real with you guys. You know, when some of the teams out there that we didn't like were doing really well, yeah, we had to take a hiatus for a year or two or a few months, you know, but I told Monty, look, TSM shit now, Fnatic shit now, every week, we're back to the old schedule, we've got to be diligent with this, we've got to be the watchman on the wall, who else is going to complain about TSM and Fnatic every single week? Fnatic didn't even play this week, but we'll still find find a way to crowbar them in. Yeah, and and much like, you know, the Black Watch in, in Game of Thrones, we're just kind of forced to be here to defend the Empire for all of you guys against the ravaging hordes of esports degenerates. And you know how much we get paid for this? Nothing at all. <laughs> so, you know, you could show just a little bit more gratitude, I think. Uh, By the be- way, the guests for this episode, if people didn't see the tweet, the first guest will be Raz, that guy who used to do the LPL but now does the LCS. Obviously, we'll be talking about the playoffs with him. And then similarly, for the LEC playoffs, we've got Mac, who is the head coach of Mad Lions. Actually, interesting detail there. I'm actually even going to ask him if he even was a head coach previously. I've got a little wrinkle for you guys there. But we'll wait until he comes on. I'll maybe tease it a little bit there. But obviously, his team won the championship. Pretty notable in that sense. And they're a team where they do all come from the upper bracket file. So... We'll just do it that order, but as usual, we start out with the segment. I personally, like I always say, I preferred it when they just had to sit there while we did all this, but whatever. Monty decides to just, you know, be, be polite and let them just join later <laughs> instead of just, you know, feeling like... Uh, I have to say, though, the one reason why it actually is good, I've realised now why we segment it like this, is because if you notice, we tend to load the really spicy topic in at the front, and it yes. just means that they don't have to, like, say something and potentially get fired yes. and ruin their whole lives, etc. So, you know... <laughs> we are and, sort of doing my favor in a way and they're watching so if they want to walk into the minefield later they have that choice to give their take on it right but we don't obligate them to sit here awkwardly while yeah, we course. go on rants <laughs> so now here's the, the thing still there because i have self-awareness but don't give a fuck what other people think or even myself about myself i can simultaneously be aware of flaws i have but then also just go with it and sometimes lean into it harder for effect so here's a classic one everyone else monty had this sentiment wow what a great weekend of games banger best of five full five game series in lec banger best of five full five game series in lcs banger best of five full series in lpl wow what a great weekend of games so of course i hated it and here's a lot of the reasons why that i'll now in incredibly annoying detail go into so here's one trend right that i can't handle in league of legends monty right because unlike other esports games in league of legends the premise of the fifth game in the best of five is obviously enshrined because of the whole silver script song isn't it so it became a meme that people wanted to go to the five games now listen i understand the premise just stars in CSGO, I understand the premise that a lot of the most thrilling games you remember were the 16-14 maps or the overtimes or the third map decider. Famous example for people, the Boston Major, where Cloud9 did that amazing win over FaZe Clan. Yeah, these are the memories that stick in your mind as like epic games. But there has always been a flaw where people literally they take that and they make it too simplistic like what their logic goes is it has to be the fifth game for it to be a good series any time it gets to a fifth game it's a good series and here's probably the worst one because it's the most subtle and you'll understand immediately why i'm bringing the topic up now if the fifth game is really good it doesn't fucking matter what happened to the other four games they could be the worst games the league of legend ever <laughs> played it is now the best series ever it is now the greatest series we've hit a new height of the game like People don't, because one of the flaws with it, and then a that's the LCS that, finals, right? There. The other tangent to that, which is why I'll tie it to the LCS, by the way, is the fifth game is really close, and that makes it a great series. Well, it can be a close, bad game, 
you know, it can be a game where both teams in. It can be two games that are too nervous. That might be exciting. Might not be the best qualitative League of Legends. So basically, one thing I did think about that in that sense is because there's two ways to attack this. One, I want to get your thoughts on that in general. Because I've had this the same in CSGO. Like in CSGO, because obviously it's the most easy way to potentially make a hype setting, is if the last round of a three-map series, which we have best of three in CSGO, isn't decided the whole game yet. Yeah, the fact that either team can still win the game is what makes it hype, right? But that's just the artificial way to create hype. Like I've seen some two zeros that were some of the best games ever played yep. incredibly close like back and forth so i want to get your thoughts on this because i noticed this is the reason why you see it on every playoff um uh every playoff sequence people are always between each map like oh i hope we get to the fifth game like it's sort of enshrined in people's mind that is how you get great entertaining league of legends i mean just to be straight up like neither the lcs nor the lec finals are going to be considered all-time great best of fives right for the reasons that you're stating and while i do think that the the fifth game of the lcs finals was wonderful oh, it was very like, fun yeah it was great um i i there were so many just like wacky throws and the other games and, and kind of low quality play oh, also the fifth game in the lpl uh it was actually the lower bracket match or whatever but that was a bang result i haven't seen it yet i haven't i haven't seen it yet the fx one i'm talking about basically so go yeah look at that if you haven't seen it yeah I, I will i will be watching it before next week when we do an lpl episode with with nelson but um i haven't had a chance to watch it because it happened in the middle of the night for me and then i spent all day watching that, L did up to the that, way. that, that one was almost good <laughs> yeah so but i i do think that when we talk like you have to put it in the context of other great five game series in league of legends history like the all-time great series and the really the most interesting best of fives have been the ones where obviously both teams are playing well and that you see a, like distinct counter stratting or like a clash of styles so of course skt versus kt bullets is is a classic example um, uh, SKT versus Rocks at Worlds, where the the support misfortune the came out. Ones, yes, the semifinal because that was like, oh no, like Rocks is in a bad place. Yeah, oh, yeah. Here's their secret pick, and then they're gonna win with it. And it was the same thing in SKT versus KT Bullets, where it was like, oh, KT comes in with this fast pushing strat, and then SKT like adapts to this assassin style, and then you know you kind of get to see both really interesting qualities of that or you know kt arrows versus samsung blue um it, those are probably the three best best of fives that have ever happened in league of legends history um so i would say that it, you know it going to five games resulted in exciting game fives like yes. this is true but also even the lec finals I, i'm really looking forward to talking to mac about this because that guy must have been shitting his pants in the of back course. He, they had like a 20 minute Baron rogue and then rogue just threw, they just threw the game. So I mean, I, it was, it was wild, but it wasn't, it wasn't like rogue closed the game correctly. They kind of just handed it right back to mad lions and humanoid did every, you know, humanoid and Arma did everything in their power to, to claw back into the game. So credit for them, but I, I don't think they should have ever had that opportunity. So I'm very curious to get max take on that series. Uh, it, and they can be exciting, but you're those those finals are never going to be enshrined in in like the annals of of great best of fives, right? Uh, it's just not going to happen. I think there are other really compelling storylines that we're going to talk about. Like I think Cloud Nine's really questionable play that you could really tell that Perks was super clutch uh, towards the end of that best of five games four and five. Uh, which is what you pay him the big money for. And he lived up to that expectation. So there is a lot of cool stuff that happened. But By the way, along these lines, because obviously we're contrasting regions and context here, and we're not just looking at the absolute value of did it go to game five, was a game exciting. Along those lines, I'll also just do like a minor call out here. So someone who I have many times, I'm sure I will many times in the future, given a lot of praise to for his particular skill set is Fion on Fire, as he's called on Twitter. Fion, obviously, formerly of ESPN. Basically, all those fucking sites that take millions of VC money and then all go bust and then they go and work somewhere else. He's one of the best of the ones who works for those ones. He's probably one of the best narrative writers in esports history, particularly yep. with League of Legends, because he's been in the game he specialized in. But I believe he went into, like, I think a little bit of Overwatch and even. Well, Call I used Duty, to read him in StarCraft. Cool. ESPN, that's oh, ages ago, man. That was when he was on forums. But yeah, here's the thing, right? The problem is this. Fion has one massive blind spot, which is nuts, which is for some weird reason, right? In League of Legends, I've always said the game league itself, there's something about the game my brain doesn't like, just doesn't like intuitively understand. And so I have to sort of basically pass 
all the smartest opinions and see what I think or what makes sense to me and see if like, actually that, that just makes sense if I go back and look. I have to sort of like check my work in that sense, right? I can't intuitively know the gear. I feel like he has the same problem, but as a result, he makes some really weird comments that are basically qualitative judgments that always come off as weird to me. So a classic one is he was one of the main people on all those ESPN hot rankings or whatever, like power rankings, who would always be fucking putting like the top Western team like way too high for like three or four years. Like when TSM was number one with double lifting Bergson, this has been the guy who like had to have them like, you know, like fourth in the world or something with like LPL and LCK going. So anyway, along those lines, he had a tweet that was right in the vein of what we're talking about now, Monty, and it killed me inside. I'll just, what I'll do, Monty, is instead of telling you what I'm annoyed with, I'll read it to you and you can have your first crack. I think I know which one it is. You know which one it is, mate? As soon as I start, you're going to know because it's a classic, basically, it's the whole thing that you spent four years having to deal with based on LCS and, L and, oh, I know L exactly and LCK. What it was. So here it goes. He goes, any time an EU team throws a game equals, wow, what an amazing comeback. I can't believe that Shockwave missed. What high-level spacing, what a banger. Any time an NA team throws a game equals, what trash. I can't believe this is League of Legends. Ball like a fiesta, kek W, omega lol, so bad lol. Now, you, you can have first go at this one, buddy. What do you think of that? Is that would you say that's a, um, a, a, a fair, you know, genuine comparison between the regions? What do you think? Um... I think that if it only works if you think all missed shockwaves are equal, right? <laughs> or, you know, you have to look. Unfortunately, Fionn is, is really good at narrative stuff, and I've enjoyed a lot of the, the Probably features. Probably the best. I'll say yeah, that, right. I think he's the best. I, right, I know he, I'm not as good at that. I've done a lot of that stuff. You know? <laughs> he's really good at that, and I think he, he, he gives wonderful, like, takes on kind of players careers like i really enjoyed his so knowing both faker and knowing faker's father personally like i really enjoyed and thought it was accurate kind of the depiction of faker's dad that he did that i thought was great now all of that said his his eye test is completely busted when it comes to when it comes to the game analysis and which I is fine, by the way. I will just say, yeah, before, no we, before we go on in him, by the way, absolutely, he can make these tweets. I'm just using him as an example because he's a famous individual of, of like, this is like a classic take people in the community often have. That's why I brought him to Monty because his whole career was motherfuckers going, Monty, when the team in Korea, who are the best in the world, do a, 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 a moving macro that's not the best, you say it was questionable. But when TSM threw up the Baron, you say it was a bad fight. Like, it's like you, you've had the same thing your whole career, right? It's the same basic well, setup every time. I also think that in <laughs> my case it's it's a bit different because I, I i was wearing multiple hats at the time right so on the one hand i have to be when i'm on broadcast i have to have a certain standard of impartiality i'm not just going to be like oh yeah this is shit it's my job to explain the thought process and what's going on in the game right and uh i have to make it exciting for people because that's my purpose so I think people didn't understand because sometimes I would temper my criticism on a broadcast, but then I would go ham on them on like my own content or, or summoning insight or whatever, which is more entertaining for the talk show content. Right. So there's kind of like two different, so people would see that and they'd be like, Monty, why aren't you criticizing them equally? But I was doing two different things, right. With two different tones. So I, I do understand why that could be construed as confusing. Um, but I think in this case, like, you really just have to understand that it's the context around a missed shockwave that's important. Was it the player error who was using the shockwave? Was it a good counterplay that caused the shockwave to miss? Uh, it, there's just too much. And so I think as a blanket statement, it's just really lazy and um, not particularly interesting. And also by that logic, it's kind of just like a slippery slope logical fallacy of how could we possibly predict anything? If that is true, if he believes that, then why is he the one making power rankings globally? If if he can't tell the difference, or that even is even a question in his or, mind, or all the LCS one legit you should be able to. That. Or logically, the team that's number one in LCS, by your logic, Fion, should have an actual crack at being number one in the power ranking. Why not? Why aren't they mates? Oh, it's because there's context to who they're playing and how they actually play and what you can see with your eyes. Because my problem with this, right, is very simple. I'll, without going into it, that's why I let you do that. Cause you got you hit all the basic checkpoints there, right? All I would say is this. Right, here's the reason why, Fionn, and this is a killer, mate. It's because they aren't playing the same, mate. I know it sounds mad because I am making a subjective qualitative judgment, but I would just say any expert would tell you the same thing. So the point is, right, when someone who's God-tier makes a mistake, 
It's actually possible. I might be the one who's wrong for thinking it's a mistake. Maybe he's better than me. I'll tell you what, right? When Greg fucks up his jungle, actually, I could be right that he's wrong on that. He isn't fucking Tarzan from season eight, mate. He actually might not be doing the jungle right. He's not even supposed to be in the game. I don't to be like a fucking clerk's paraphrase. He wasn't even supposed to be there today, was he? So, like, that's the problem with that. And then similarly, right? Let's not be real and pretend like NA has macro. We'll probably get into it in this episode. It is the most persistent problem in the history of League of Legends for any region. No re I know everyone still thinks that LPL is just people all fighting under towers. It definitely isn't and hasn't been since Season 5, by the way. I'd even say like EDG in Season 4 already were away from that. But you know what? The one stereotype that does remain, and this is great for you because it's only NA has it, is that NA doesn't have macro to this day. To this day, NA does not know how to do even the best objective control. Forget everything else. Doesn't know how to side lane. Doesn't understand flanking still, as Jensen just showed us. One of the best players to ever play in NA. Like, they don't understand basic high-level concepts in League of Legends. Or they do, rather, but they can't manifest it in the game. How about that? Like, they can't coordinate to get to work. So, it, 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 they are just worse for you. And then, secondly, the one last thing I'd say is this. I'll just let the fan... I love it when you do this, right? Because I like the Socratic method. I'll let the fans be the determiner of this one, right? I'll ask you, fans... Do you, do you think when people watch LEC on the broadcast, players in interviews, fans watching it, do people watch LEC and go, wow, all these comebacks are just great comebacks? Like, none of these are throws. The word throw, that's not in the vernacular people talk about LEC, is it? You are aware LEC is the region where the most beloved ca analyst, Cadrill, his fucking catchphrase is the game is lost when, like, the wrong jungler gets the scuttle crab early in the game. <laughs> and he even himself will say it. Why, obviously, just meant, you know, he was behind in the game, like... Motherfucker! <laughs> He's saying the game is lost! Like, people love the hyperbole if it was a thrown of game. Course. So, like, I'm never going to hear that LEC just say the game is lost. Every motherfucker says well, that. We're, we're about ourselves, by the way, in about the checks of the watch. 30 minutes, going to talk non stop about rogue fucking throwing games against Mad Lions. Non stop. <laughs> it's going to be mental. Well, maybe an hour for that one, to be fair. Yeah. And I, th I think the other, the other aspect, um, like when we, we look at NA macro too, is that there isn't really an excuse because ping doesn't matter. You could literally learn how to do this from other teams in other regions. So the persistent it's just decision background making. Yeah, of course. Is, is like so confusing to me because yes. you can fix this with film review. One would think, one would think, apparently you can't, but one would think you could fix it with film review and having these conversations and then drilling it very specifically in your scrims, but it just can't. It just can't happen for whatever reason. Uh, I, <laughs> By the way, I had one last thing, if you want, before they do this. It's just yeah, yeah. a very brief one. It's a very, very minor, minor grievance, I will say, right? But I think it's worth talking about, right? Here's the thing, Monty. You know, in general, like, you worked with me on Flashpoint. My flavor of esports in general is let's not have too many rules. Let's not be too strict. Let's definitely not, by the way, have a stick up our ass, not be able to have fun and joke, etc. But I do think there is a context of certain entities that it is inappropriate to take that approach from. Like, for example, I'll give you an obvious one, Monty. Let's imagine there was an entity like we have. It's not really in League very much, but it's in, in CSGO. It's quite well known at the moment called ESIC. It's like the Esports you know, Integrity Coalition. Right? Coalition yeah. I don't think it would be appropriate for them, for example, to just make like meme jokes on Twitter about people who match fix. Like, I think that would be inappropriate, <laughs> even though, by the way, in theory, like I don't want them fired or whatever, but I do think it's inappropriate for that particular sure. entity. What I would say in that scenario is if you're the person who runs the social media, just make the joke on your own account or make it on a side account or something. Don't do it on the main one. So you might know what I'm referring to here. Basically, during the LEC final, when Rogue was 2-0 up, the LEC official account just posted all those, like, the ASCII art of all those fucking candles saying summoning ritual for silver scripts. So the league official account essentially said... We really hope Rogue loses two games and they have a chance to play a fifth game. We hope that Rogue doesn't now win game three and become a brand new champion of the LEC, right? Why the fuck would the official account be doing that? That's not G2. That's not Rogue. That's not that's some banter. That's the that's like the NFL going when it was fucking 28 to 3 for the Falcons going summoning ritual for Tom Brady to win it all the time. What are you talking about? You're the league. You're the fucking league. If there's one person should be independent, it's got to be the league. Please. <laughs> and dude, as usual, because you know how it works, ginger man bad. Don't worry, Monty. No one agrees with me. Nobody. In the whole world, nobody agrees with me. I'm just wrong. And even though, Monty, they're going to say we're unprofessional for making jokes on a joke podcast, it's, that's actually fine because I said it, so I'm wrong. Anything, remember, whatever I say, guys, it's why, like, actually, I found, like, when I say stuff like, I believe in free speech, like, you're the fucking most evil person ever. I'm like, oh, 
This is an interesting world to live in. So what are your thoughts? I think that the appropriate tweet is Rogue is one game away for becoming the first, you know, new champion that we've had in the last four years or whatever the timeline was, right? And I think that you you try and push the narrative that's on the <clears throat> on the plate already and set up for, you know, fans being hyped about Rogue winning. That's that's what I would do instead. Oh, I think how about it's a this? Approach. RT for Rogue to close it out in three, like for the silver scripts, and we'll get a fair... Yep. You know, so one of those, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You make it, again, make it so you, like, weird out a little bit. Because as I say, it's just the fact it's the official league account. Like, uh, like in that scenario as well, the reason why I also get slightly mad about that, right, is because it's like this. Even the league accounts are just going to clout chase for fucking stupid likes, like these morons who farm 14-year-old Fortnite kids. Even league accounts! That are trying to, in theory, be like esports history and prestige. And, and even they're going to post it. Like, at this point in time, the LEC account may as well have posted, if this put tweet gets 10,000 likes, I will tattoo the winner's name on my face. Like, that's the next level LEC account. That's where you're going at this point in time. That's who you're going to be in about three months from now, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I think you leave that to the teams. I think you leave that to the teams. and Or, I mean, even even the casters on the broadcast can, I think, theoretically say something or, or pass that off, right? But I think you press the narratives that you have or that are on the verge of unfolding. Um, and you can just come back and be like, oh, Mad Lions back in it now after they win game three. Can we, you know, are we going to see this to, uh, as a five-game series or the reverse sweep is on the table or whatever, right? All right, we do have to get Raz on at this point in time. So we're gonna take a quick break, get Raz on the show, and we'll be talking about the LCS finals in just a couple. Right, Welcome back. back. Oh, Obviously, you go, I thought you I was go. doing the intros. I, I was just, it's okay, we're back. We've got Raz here, as I said before, most famously perhaps working on the LPL in the past. He also coached a bunch of teams, including Dig EU back in the day, if anyone's really old school. But more recently, last few years, he's been known for appearing on the LCS and uh, impersonating, uh, was it Bert from... Uh, Sesame Street, right? That's a nice haircut there. Tribute. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Ross. There's the Ross. There All, right. All right. There it is. All right. <laughs> he's, he's, still, he's still a coach. He's still a coach. Okay. Uh, but oh, yeah. Which I, team I, do you work with? 100 Thieves or something, right? Who is it? Uh, not anymore, but like last uh, last uh, split, I was working with uh, Golden Guardians Academy. Golden so, Guardians. Uh, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Uh, I, I prefer to think of him as the most frequent guest on Hotline League, the greatest League of Legends show in existence. Do, a great show. <laughs> do, do you enjoy uh, the, the plebs calling in and asking Some, questions? Sometimes, like, it just, it's a hard coin flip because, like, I know for sure the takes either going to be in good intent, like, and it's, it's going to be fun. I'm surprised if there's going to be any analytical points to it. Like, that's, that's a good surprise. And you got some people that are just there to shit talk. And then when they get pushed on anything, they're gone. <laughs> like, it's like any any challenge. Yes. And it's like, I never believed in it to begin with. <laughs> I was like, I just by the way, myself. By the opinion. way, what, what you're talking about there is why actually like, all, you know, like, you, you know, I'll give you a classic example. Here's the analogy, right? There's a very famous thing in the stand-up comedy culture that they always have that joke where they say that, you know, when hecklers like start shouting at the stand-up comedian, they're always like, huh, I wish I could go down to his job and heckle him when he's doing it, right? But obviously you couldn't really do that. Like it wouldn't work and it wouldn't have the same effect. So similarly, right? As someone who's a content creator or an analyst, your dream really, when you hear all all these morons talking shit. It's like, look, if I if this guy actually had to say that to my face and argue me, like, yeah, then it'd be interesting. It isn't interesting. Spoiler, because as you've just said, I did this twice, Raz. I did two shows. Think of who I picked as my course for these shows. I did a show with Veteran and I did a show with LS and the premise was the same. We did these shows, live shows, where it was just four people to call in and debate these guys. Because I thought, right, these guys get all this hate and vitriol and people constantly dismissing them. So you know what? If there's that many people have all these points against them and think they don't know what they're talking about, Fuck it, let's open the the lines. And the idea was, uh, think about it, I like spicy content. People can be spicy and I'll just sort of keep them within bounds, keep the conversation going. Dude, that idea sounds great. It never worked. I'm not joking. If 100 people called in, two were even vaguely critical. And as you yeah. say, even then, the second you made a good point, well, yeah, that's the problem. They'd already thought of their one point. They hadn't thought of what your count would be. So they just fold instantly. So as a result, yeah. what you found is the actual people who talk shit, they don't fucking call in. And the ones who do, sadly, they, to call in, they must in some way care about what you think. thinking. So if you make a good point, they just go, yeah, maybe I don't know anything about the game. All right, that's the end of that conversation then, isn't it? You know? 
I, I, I just, I respect Hotline League because I think it's really big of Travis. He gave himself a platform uh, yeah. so that everyone could kind of listen to the fact that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then not only that, but then he gave it to everyone else as well. So that's that's really noble, not to just hog it, hog it all to himself there, right, Raz? Oh my God. <laughs> he's not even going to watch this. He's just, he's just, what the hell am I hearing? <laughs> to be fair, though, Travis, I don't think ever actually does claim to be an expert on League of Legends. So I will say that. I will just put that out there. I, will, I don't think most, he has ever actually claimed to be one. So. Yeah, exactly. The greatest thing, though, is that whenever any caller comes in and talks about like revenue sharing or anything particular, that he's just like, He's That's on. He's like, sure, yeah. he's like, all right, get, get comfortable. Bring the mic up close. <laughs> this is my time. He's all right, uh, right. Listen, look, guys. But, but he also does it in a here's way. Here's the seventh million reason. Bad, bad. Right, here's the seventh million reason that Reddit and Riot actually aren't that bad. You know, if you really think about it. Please uh, don't remove my threads and uh, let me come to the LCS. That's, that's why I think they're actually not as bad as people say, like Richard Lewis and Thorin. You know. <laughs> Decent impression. <laughs> right, now, Mark, uh, can you fill up the next 40 minutes? Uh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk start, about LCS. Uh, yeah, let's, let's let's stop bagging on Travis because it's just too easy. And uh, let's go, now, let's wait go a minute. over to Why have we finals? just wasted 20 minutes on Travis and Hotline League when <laughs> not only did TSM lose Monty... <laughs> they lost to a sub jungler. Wait, the sub jungler was Greg. Wait, he's renamed himself. Wait, and could only play one champion. They lost the best of five. Wait, wasn't even a fifth game. Wait, I'm just going to keep saying wait for effects. It's now. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. You don't have to wait anymore. It happened. It's real. Put well, it on well, your fucking gravestone, sky writing, put it in a time capsule, the hundred years, open it up, read those facts in a row. They'll still be as hilarious. Dude, this is like, this was like Christmas for me because think about it, right? I already had Fnatic get eliminated way early. Then Reckless just gets probably the greatest set of teammates ever assembled. Shits the bed completely. He doesn't even get to the finals. I'm thinking this day can't get much better. So then I look on my schedule. Ah, tonight's going to be shit though wasn't it? It's not going to be a great game. Team Liquid against TSM. I mean, they're fucking, you know, they haven't got a jungler. I didn't even know what I was in for, mate. That was amazing. I was like, I, I had a grin eight. I was like the fucking, that cat out of fucking Alice in Wonderland. Mate, was cat. Yeah. <laughs> but wait, was... as you said on Twitter, not only was Grig, the former TSM jungler, the sub jungler, but he was replacing Santorin, the former TSM jungler. And also Liquid had Tactical, the former TSM Academy AD carry that they chose not to use. So the level of depth here about kind of the, the, the TSM throwaways uh, destroying TSM was was pretty small. Oh, what's fucked up as well? Like, I will say, it wasn't just only on the Team Liquid side that there was, like, deficiencies. Like, TSM literally couldn't even bring their coach, I heard. And they had to get, like, their old washed-up mid laner to fucking do it. And, like, listen, he did his best job, like, kind of like Greg did. But God, what can he expect, mate? He's not a real coach. He's just a guy who used to farm under tower and then tell his jungle, like, just fucking going in. So, oh, zero six at Worlds. I'll be home in three weeks. Whatever. That's the end of the road, folks, in segment. <laughs> Well, it just kept the narrative of Bjergsen being beaten by his own wards. Just differently this time. Well, the joke is, <laughs> after all these years... Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? I mean, my, my joke would just be Bjergsen saying, Greg, really? Still denying us finals? And then he just says, always. That was actually a Harry Potter <laughs> reference, I believe it or not. I've never even read Harry Potter. I just know what the kid's like, basically. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's already a good one, Raz. It's, it's already, already, yeah. it's already a bad one. <laughs> I should have known when I was going. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Um, with this, I'm like, here's the thing. Watching their game, and I, I even watched it back earlier today, just to, because they have a lot of issues. Just so people knew, TSM versus Team Liquid, uh, before hearing about the substitution, I thought it was going to be a 3 1. Team Liquid. Like, I absolutely thought, like, Team Liquid is a far better team. I thought that yeah. right now in North America, there are just two strong teams that can compete at a high level uh, in Team Liquid and Cloud9. But when I heard the substitution, like, first of all, just so you know, I think Armeo is, like, he's actually improved quite a bit. I think he is a great jungler. Watching his academy games and then, like, his, um, you know, the third party tournaments in Northern Arena, I, like, Team Liquid Academy were like a top, were a top two team in there, um, and in part because of him. So like I thought, like I, I was pretty high on, um, but I once again, the biggest issues with this team was like, sure, this is last week, the last week your practice going into the finals, you now are plopped with a jungler that is competition for the for the entire split has been Academy and amateur players. Like that's not going to set you up to succeed, and your players who are mid and top 
are now going to have to like have like basically core conversations with you. The last time they've had those talks were like in lock and tournament that he played. Right. That's not enough time. Um, so I thought that was going to be a big issue. Um, you know, roles of responsibility as a jungler are pretty like pretty massive for the first like 10, 15 minutes of the game. And team TSM. Their previous series, I thought they they for sure would have resolved a few of the huge ass issues. Like I thought, like drafting problems for sure they would look back on, it, and those are easy conversations to have as long as you are on the same page on it. And uh, it, they didn't. I think a lot of the same draft problems like immediately came in game one, where when they see a first pick Nar, which they tried, like Team Liquid for sure did their homework and was like they're just gonna early prio Nar, so we're gonna do it and challenge them. They picked Renekton, which will get bodied by the Nar, like. First two picks, you're picking Renekton. So not only are you going to get destroyed by Nar, you give the opportunity. Oh, into the best top player in the league as well. Just into the yes. absolute best top player. <laughs> so you go bad matchup into a comp that you can't do shit into because they have Victor, Zaya. Like, there are so many ways to just kite back away from you. Um, so, like, it, it would be a miracle if the Renekton gets a proper fight. So, like, that to me, I think, was just ridiculous. So Shout out first... Hooney for making LS look really good with his analysis of an acting, by the way. Like, Hooney, you, you did a great job there, man. I think, so, yeah. I think too, you know, even though TSM won that game, the fact that they were blue side first picking Renekton and giving over Hecarim Thresh was also just hilarious. That game, that game actually Team Liquid won. The one, the one day they ended, TSM ended up winning. No, no, was... TSM won that game, game three. No, I'm talking about game one, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah game one. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. No, yeah, I'm saying yeah, later yeah. in the series, yeah, you're talking yeah, about the yeah, drafting yeah. issues. Like you're you're in game three, and then you first you you know you first pick, pick Renekton, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's there's so many angles in this series we can go into. Like one of them has to be the Hooney discussion. Because here's the thing, right? When I made my video about how like TSM had wasted their time signing Hooney, and like, why is this your fucking big money signing, etc.? I mean, obviously they'd go, Oh, well, we actually had another one that was even worse. Like, all right, we'll get to that later. No, when they do that signing though, right? If you don't know this, Monty, I actually have a very different way of releasing content to other people because part of what I like to do is historical context, right? So as a result, I don't release a Hooney video when like Hooney's in fucking LCS Academy and it's like everyone's just banging on him because like what would be what what new thoughts am i bringing to the space by bringing that out what's interesting everyone's just gonna say he sucks right i prefer if you think a player's overrated you should actually say it when they're in theory having some success because what you're trying to say is even when they have some success there are flaws to what they do and eventually those flaws will show out so i actually did that video right at the time when Hooney was like this when they started that little streak at basically in the beginning of the split but like this is the reason i did it guys because first of all would you tsm fans learn that the regular split is not the playoffs I've seen Hooney's whole career. Guess what? When he's in LCS, he always has Smurf games in the regular season, but even then it's like one out of three is a Smurf game. And in the playoffs, I've not even seen the LCS playoffs or something. Have I missed it where Hooney's having all these series in LCS playoffs for the last six years where he's carrying? As far as I can see, he always just fucking shits the bed in all the big games. There's a, there's a reason the guy's never been in a final in LCS, you know, because even though he is a very good player, this is why our joke and say he's like some like, I mean, this is a fucking broken reference now. He's like the, the Western Marin, as it were. Like he just has like, it, it's just feast or famine every time this guy plays the game and you saw it in this series here like what the fuck was he doing against Alfari nothing just getting fed or I mean he was feeding him rather <laughs> yeah I, I think he's like a top three top four top laner I think the biggest issue for me is just like yeah, but if you want to win the league that's a, a position you need to be really good right yeah I think the, the biggest issue, yeah I think that's a that, that's probably the case I also think that like the mentality of like knowing what matchup you'd want in the situation like it's not going to be like if it's if, he, if they're picking first pick Nar or first pick Renekton and all these things that, like, he's going to be put in a bad situation on, that's him wanting that. Like, it's not going to be the coach saying, we want you to pick this shit. Like, they're the ones that I have a lot of faith in. Their coaching staff of Yerkes and Curry, I don't think that at all is what they would want. It's, oh, I'm it's, sure they it's trust Tony if he says he wants the matchup. Yeah, of course. So, so or, Rez, Rez. That's speculation. Hold, hold on, hold on. We have, we also, have let's be real. Ahead. You don't sign Hooney and then tell him, I'm going to pick your champion every game. It's Hooney. We have to go back. Like, I agree with you that he must have been complicit in these drafts and agreeing mm -hmm. to do this, which put himself in a bad situation. As a coach, you just have to not let him do that. But at yeah. the same time, Raz, he didn't get a kill in this entire series. In four games, that. he did not get a single kill. So at a certain point in time, if you're telling me he's a top three top laner in the league, then either what you're saying is that much like the Team Liquid slash C9 gap between them and the next best team, right? That there must be some insane top lane fall off after like Alfari and potentially Fudge. 
Um, yeah, and also I'm just changing. Like, I think this is just my opinion on the whole regular season, right? And that's so like my after playoffs, my yeah, okay. opinion on top lane is for sure changing. Like initially going into the playoffs, I would have Alfari, Impact, uh, Huni, Fudge, Someday. Like I think that would be how I would frame it. Okay. Um, but then off of Someday's performance, he was falling off. I actually had like that. That was like during the reg- uh, playoffs. I would go Someday um, before, uh, after Elf, um, Fudge. And then now I'm looking at Huni, and of course, I, I like just based off of the performance of Fudge, he's definitely rising based off player performance alone. Like series after series, he's just having insane games. So, um, yeah, after a point, he's uh, Huni is falling. But like, I, I think the drafts are making it harder. I also just think that the way TSM thinks about the game and how they think about Rift Herald, they watching their games, uh, they over um, what is it called again? They send like every member to objectives. Over prioritize. Right? So, like for instance, their Rift Herald plays. They'll just sack bot lane. Like they'll lose two waves bot lane by sending AD carry. And I'm like, okay, well, is AD carry losing farm? No, he's picking up mid wave. Well, who's fuck? Oh, it's Power of Evil losing farm. Or, oh, it's Renekton losing waves. Like they can do these things without having to send four people. Like there was one comical part in the series, I think, when they had four people looking for a dive on top lane on NAR, on Alfari. And they just. He was just getting mega nars. So we're like, okay, well, this is not going to work. <laughs> so we just yeah, sent. Who called that exactly? Yeah. More, exactly. They just sent an insane amount of resources for nothing. So, so this is the people who are just calling this in game. And these are the issues that I have with TSM a, a lot of the times. But my counterpoint to that is that weirdly, I think it works in terms of NA mind games because I think they're a part of the reason why TSM was getting these like 20 minute barons in a lot of their games or other teams were throwing into them is probably because they don't expect four or five people to be yep. at that objective. And mm-hmm. so then they start a fight down a player right and then they lose and then tsm gets a free bear in it like 22 minutes into the game and that's the thing like because that is a concept like that's a concept of just sending members because like if you think this is going to be a game ending fight like for instance if it's third dragon fourth dragon yeah well, who the who the hell cares about top lane wave when you can just send all your multiple members there but if it's not a game ending play and if it's something that you can still fight for while still prioritizing wave on an ad carry or something like that then why are you doing it and they, they do this a lot so like that was my issue with it is that there it wasn't as if they were like oh we're just gonna go top lane take top lane turret while you know tactical is literally just for taking full ways bot turret on his own uh, and really TSM's not getting a gold lead at all for it they're just like losing experience like it's just an issue with how they think about the game that works against a lot of teams like seventy percent of the teams <laughs> like are just are getting wasted by this. Um, but if they want to be a championship team and if they want to still be ahead of 100 Thieves, who hell knows what's going to happen next split with the team, right? It, they could very well easily improve because all of this thing happened last minute. And I think they need to get better at this. I, I don't know if they're going to learn their lesson because I feel like these things have led them to wins because the enemy team is making an, a mistake of fighting instead of just punishing the move. And so... In their mind, this is probably how they're actually coming out ahead, right? Dude, it's weird. I it's agree weird. because of this. Think of this, right? What yeah. is the one game that TSM won in this series? The team, the game where Team Liquid was like, well, it wouldn't be really sportsman like to just win 3 0 with a sub. So let's just randomly do a five man wipe int in the middle and then you can just have a game. Like, what? <laughs> like, dude, that was a game where no joke. You know, people make that exaggeration. Like, oh, you blink and you miss it. Dude, in this game, literally, it's like a totally even state game. And if you dared to go in the in the fucking kitchen for a cup of coffee, the game would have been over when you came back. Like, like I have never seen a more ridiculous like team just decide, like, I think I'm just done with this. It was almost like StarCraft. Team Liquid may as well just type like GG and just left the server. Like, when you know, when you know the other guy's got like a bigger army, like, yeah, fuck this, I'm with. Like, what was that? What was game three? What was the end of that game? Can someone explain this to me? Because, by the way, Fion, I hope you're listening, mate. But I watch games like that, I don't go, How is this different from elite level LPL? Man? Shut up, Fion. Like, that was one of the worst endings to a game I've ever seen, mate. You know, the one where they just ARAM in the mid Raz and they all, and for some reason, don't really oh, yeah, in yeah. the game, just <laughs> all focus <laughs> speaker who's running away from them. Like, why is this as well? Why are people, why are there champions still in LCS, in NA, that have movement that people chase like fucking cats with a laser pen pointer? Why are you doing that still? 
Have you ever, listen, this is one of those moments where I've always wondered because this is the thing, right? The real problem with games is the second you play a game, it's like the iceberg principle. It's like you lock off a lot of your, own, your subconscious and you can only access like sort of like a live stream data feed, like your REM as it were. So the problem is you can't really like pause and then think like, like laterally around what you're going to do. But even so, surely one of the most fundamental concepts in League is like target selection in a 5v5 team fight. And surely, surely you didn't think the jungle was the target. Surely it would be, I don't know, the AD carry, the fucking mid laner who's caught out who hasn't you, or maybe the guy who's just bursting all this. Like, come on, man. This is this is ABC stuff. That's my point for Yon. These are the ABCs of the league, mate. This isn't high level concepts. So, like, I, I, I do not remember this fight. The only thing I remember about this game was the fact that Team Liquid literally 2v2 kills, kills them bot lane, while Alfari is like hard stomping solo, like top lane and assigned versus Renekton matchup. Like, Team Liquid just won based off lanes alone. I think the only thing was, like, there was a 2v2 mid that Armeo and Jensen ended up losing. Well, so our power people had a huge lead. But, like, outside of that... Oh, and picks the, the on... Free, the free Baron, dude. That's it as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, so I I, I really have... Yeah, there was, right they had now. a Baron steal on this one, right? Am I thinking the right no, game? No, it's not a steal. They literally just gave up the Baron for free. And, like, it was 5-5 in terms of kills. Gold lead was dead even at 28 minutes. And Tactical and Armeo and Core JJ are standing around their red buff on red side. And meanwhile, just over the wall, the Baron is going down and they just don't do anything. They just don't do anything. <laughs> it's, like, it's so crazy to watch this. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, no, that's the other bad thing about in general, in NA. There's another thing I can't believe. Like Raz said, the real problem is, right, TSM, you would hope, would be uh, with Team Liquid and C9. It's like, you know, they're elite teams in the region. At least you've got, like, a few teams that are up there. Whenever I've watched these games between TL and Team Liquid, whether it was with Greg or whether it was when they had Santorin, the amount of games where TSM is just watching people take objectives or people are just like letting TSM take Barons, like this isn't even like, again, you're not even reaching the fundamental level of the game. Like the basic concept of objective control is you, go, you contest for it or you don't. There's no like, well, I was contested, but not contested. And I'll let them take it. Well, you just did nothing then. You <laughs> traded for, you You did like that fucking trade meme everyone's doing. I give you a Baron. I received nothing and lost waves. Like, great deal. Yeah, awesome. Sick deal. Yeah. <laughs> Bring up the so, Trump meme. This is the worst deal in the history of whatever. Like, you know that one. Raz, the I sent you a, the yeah, time theft mod. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. This is pretty absurd. <laughs> you can click on it. The one where they get wiped. It's so no, no, no. It's, it's so the, it's, the, it's the free Baron. Oh, the free Baron in this okay. game where they're just standing there and they know what's going on because Armeo just ults over on Ec over the Baron wall at Hecarim on the last possible second. So they apparently know it's happening, but they just don't do anything. By the way, yeah. obviously, like, like there is another angle I think we have to discuss here, right? Which goes like this: it's basically the jungle angle with Greg. I, I'm going to call him Greg because I like this. That's his fucking name forever, mate. Armeo in that case, right? So here's the problem I have, right? Even though, as you say, I agree. Like, put it this way: Greg used to be terrible in the playoffs, in my opinion. In the past, he certainly looked decent. And in the context of the fact he had to play last minute, he's not even supposed to be here. He did a fairly admirable job. Like, put it this way: he didn't yeah. lose them the game. Which, by the way, is literally I'm not joking. The main thing I would tell a player in that situation is look. Don't expect to think you're going to be like the best player. Just, just you know, do the basic things that you can. Communicate with people. Just don't lose the game. Just don't make a big blunder. And trust that, you know what? You've got Jensen and fucking Alfari, mate. They could probably win this game if we just don't make mistakes. So in that sense, I think he did a good job. But my problem is this. The first thing I think of if someone tells me that TL wins the series is I have to start looking at TSM, Spicker, and their players and go, how are you not exploiting this? Like, as I joked about before, Greg effectively could only play fucking Uday and questionably Hecarim. Those are like the two champions he could play. So already you should have a draft pinch if you're a competent team and you have good coaching. If you don't have a draft pinch, you should be drafting things which punish him. They weren't doing that. They were just doing meta junglers. Thirdly, why in this series was it not like the final where you're giving fucking Alfari the direst treatment? He doesn't have a jungler. If he doesn't have a jungler, and I have, by the way, it's because being one of the better junglers in the league. If I have, in theory, one of the best top laners like we were talking about and one of the better junglers, I'm going to make Alfari's game a nightmare because think about it, right? If I can get him behind, not only is he behind, but it's going to be really fucking tense between him and his jungler. I can ruin the whole dynamic of their team. This game, aside from like one game, basically, they look like they just gave him a free pass. I think yeah, that's why it's... I think it's why it's clutch the way that Cloud9 played because Jensen actually performed on an individual level kind of poorly in the in the TSM series. And so C9 came in with a game plan to punish Alfari and to win the 2v2 because they knew Armeo didn't have the synergy. And then not only that, we'll get to this, but that game five strat 
if you are a sub jungler and trying to deal with a lane swap scenario is a nightmare. That is a nightmare scenario. And they created that, I think, specifically to punish uh, the lack of synergy that the team would have in, in that instance. So, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Raz, go. <laughs> yeah, with, uh, with TSM, um, the specifically like trying to pinch jungle and make it a little bit more uncomfort uncomfortable for Armeo. I even said it um, coming into the series that for Team Liquid, just make it, just give yourself like really easy, straightforward comps around like Hecarim and Udi are priority. Problem with uh, TSM is that it's not even that Spika can't play those champions. It's just that the team looks really bad when they have like Lilia jungle or and like AP junglers with AD mid. Like it's just something that they're not good at playing. Um, they don't exploit mid lane advantages much well at all. Um, and then when they did show it, they had like a rumble top lane last I remember that just did not work with their comp. So I just think overall, it's just not in their style. And so it, that that part sucks. Like that part sucks if you're not flexible enough as a team to then like choke the jungle matchup. So that's one thing, like absolutely. And yeah, and I think they just need to address how they how they want to play the game through draft and how they want to play the, play the game on the map. Because I think teams will just get better. Um, summer split is always the same case. Like teams will either get better by making acquisitions to just like on whatever they've seen on spring split. Or we'll just like be scrimming. Like there are a few teams that I know that are just scrimming in downtime. And so while you're either taking a break or going through these finals, like they're just already getting prepared for the next um, regular season. So like I'm I'm a little worried because TSM did get better throughout the regular season, but this type of stuff just literally caps you. If you if if you're having like very obvious things that you either agree on or disagree on internally, but like be, you you just can't get past that barrier. So I don't know so, what their solution is. So, so here's a question. I before we move on, because I don't want to spend all the time talking about TSM, but how do you improve this team? Like, does Reggie go back and beg double lift to rejoin the roster with Sword Art? Uh I think that would be a good move if he comes and plays properly. Yeah. Um, I think I think every my issues are more so like top side. So I they have great um players in their academy roster, though their academy roster is not doing so hot. Um, but they still have like People like Hanser and Cody Sun. Sorry, um, some of them will probably be beating TSM in best of fives in like two years. So, you know, keep your eye yeah, on there we go. If history tells uh, anything. And I would say just like make it so when you're going into summer split that you you guys see the game the same way. That like if you think that this is not a good first pick, then you're challenging that and you're challenging it with roster uh, moves. Like that's how I would see it. If that's not like if if they just want to continue with the same roster and they have faith with it, then they could they can make worlds like top three. They They, they did that but I don't think that's what their uh, goal is. I mean, they did do it, but a lot of it was by the grace of 100 Thieves that could have 3-0'd that series if they had competent mid or late game macro, right? Yeah. Uh, so They it, also better hope EG don't somehow get a good AD carry on game over, mate. Like, yeah, yeah. I, they're, I, they're hoping that 100 Thieves and EG don't upgrade mid and AD carry respectively if they're running it back but i just don't think they have the the player for player ceiling talent ceiling in order to com remotely compete with cloud nine or team liquid right now well one thing i have a problem with in general is like even though they had all those games in the regular split where they certainly won like obviously they beat team liquid twice one of the problems i do have with, T with tsm is like in isolation i don't hate almost any of the players on the team to be on tsm like, even sword art by the way my fun with the sword art one was that like, you paid way too much and you and you sort of bought at the high and he's only going to go low versus what his career <laughs> was like he's not going to be like 2015 sword art is he? it's just not going to happen at this point I, in time i just game's I, different i just love the fact that they they made you know the memes write themselves the six million dollar man right they rebuilt him except worse than he was before <laughs> how do yes. you do that they don't have the technology it turns out they, they don't, don't. The no they don't they don't have the technology exactly yeah so no because here's the problem right so in isolation like for example i mean i know a lot of people would have thought this logic right if i was doing a team like dick had Maybe Sword Art's the best possible signing. Shot caller, veteran voice, worked with young players. All of his strengths work out there. The problem I had was this. Players like Hooney, uh, Spicker, Power of Evil, Sword Art. I won't comment on Lost because I think he's just okay, but whatever. It's by the by. Right? Those four players, the problem is together, I don't think that's a good team. I don't think there's very much synergy there at all. I don't think they even have very complementary styles, quite frankly. Like, I don't think those are the two solo laners I want, for example. Like, that's just not the style I want. Like, that's the problem I have is, like, I don't see how they win in the league in that regard. Like, meanwhile, you go and look at Cloud9, it's like, mate, their fucking balance is incredible. 
They've, they've got all the players you want in all the positions. So that's why if I'm TSM, I'd look at it. It's not like you did all the wrong signings. It's like what Raz is talking about. Like, they have to be on the same page. Like, you have to understand what, what are we attempting to do in this game and how are we going to be able to do it, etc. Like, this looked in... The, like, we've said it all playoffs long. Even when TSM was winning games and series, it was like other teams just bizarrely just decided to just give them a bunch of free kills. I think, um, like, in terms of team building... Evil Genius has like had the right idea with how they wanted to build their team. Like their pieces, you can I like, you can debate on, right? But the idea of having like solid top laner support that roams a mid laner that's like that that is quote unquote like flexible and best in in a in a on red side that like, is a playmaker like something like that where it's like this is how we want to draft and this is how we view the game. Where with TSM, I think it's it, it changes a lot and it's. I, I, I can see how they want to play the game. Like, I think the one trick war horses is something I, I mentioned that was like pulled from literally Monty <laughs> from like the Azubu Blaze days. Like, that's how I would see them if they have, um, you know, the power of evil and like th this this roster. But then their top, I think they just, they just need to change things. I don't know what the meta will look like on uh, Spring Split. I'm okay if they have like one style, but they just have to be really fucking good at that style. Like that's, yeah. the only, that's the only way that would challenge C9. Is this just, if they well, can't be as flexible as like being just really good at being a team fighting team. It's also not that EG didn't try and make certain player upgrades on their roster. It's that they mm -hmm. were unsuccessful in yes. acquiring the players. So yeah. it, it, it wasn't an issue of money. It wasn't an issue of intent. Like I agree with you that I think their, their roster building uh, strategy is very interesting. But frankly, like they just couldn't get the mid or AD carry that they wanted. Uh, which mm -hmm. I think was their biggest issue. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk about the actual finals now, because you were there, you were on the analyst desk. It was a really you know, great to actually be back on LAN. It's the first LCS final that's been on LAN since summer of 2019, so really important moment. Uh, it, it ended up kind of, it, it was exciting. I do think yeah. it was weird. I, it was not what anybody expected, especially with Cloud9 struggling so much so early. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about game one to kick things off because this this showed, I think, a lot of the issues that I see with Cloud9, but also why I'm hopeful about the future of this team because it was so dominant, right? They were they were on track for this like 22 minutes soul. It was looking so good. Mm -hmm. And then the problem with running a composition like the one they were running with the Callista is that you have to play it fast and you have to get that soul. You have to push the objectives. And you see what is still, I think, some synergy issues that played out over the course of this series. One synergy issue was Blabber's aggression and kind of like hair trigger flash on Udyr that ended up costing them that soul. And then eventually, even though they fought back pretty well, considering their composition ended up costing them the game in the long run. And the second that played out over the series is it's not Fudge's fault, but Fudge, it was like the team would engage without him being in position. It, it, like he was like moving into position or about to TP. And then yeah. they would just, you know, it just looked like the, the comms there, especially when Fudge was in a like pushing a lane in a different part of the map were a little bit questionable. And so these are both synergy and style issues that I think you can work on as a team. But I think like they really were a major factor in this series and caused C9 a lot more trouble than I thought they would. Yeah, I, for sure. Like, this is the type of comp that I think would succeed, like, in an LPL environment. We probably wouldn't see a Seraphine, like, first pick in an LPL. But, like, if the, um, but like this is the idea where you have an early game lead, and they were diving on 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 stacking waves, like I said. Like, I think that they punished the hell out of um, top lane Alfari one, uh, on top, like they did there throughout the series. And then they, like, destroyed them in bot, on a bot dive. I think they're, when they messed up, for sure, was on a random, like... I uh, what was it? Vulcan when they were trying to swap for top lane turret, and then Vulcan just kind of like got caught, but then they recovered. And like you mentioned, Blabber goes in, and I don't think they were on the same page of if they wanted no. to fight that Seraphine for sure. If they wanted to fight that, then Seraphine should be in position for an ulti, right? Yep. She should just like instantly look for it and they could fight for it. But then like you're right, Blabber just like took a lot of damage because they were not wanting to fight, like it, they didn't were on the same page, and then they ended up losing those fights. And you can't have that. I think that's really good footage for them to look back on if they want to succeed at MSI. But like, yeah, in the moment that shit happens, you're like, okay, well, <laughs> this yeah. is not the cop for you. <laughs> no, you're right. Like they, the, the weird thing is that 
it was getting caught out, then kind of mm. pulling back. And you're like, oh, okay, well, they stabilized, no problem. Yeah. They're just going to go, they're going to do, you know, do what they do at the top tower, and then they're going to mm. rotate over to the dragon, get the soul, and then it's game over. And then Blabber decides, no, I'm going to flash, bear slap somebody, and the rest of the team has no idea that he's going to do that. Yeah. And um, so when you're playing a delicate composition like this, you just, everybody has to know that you can't take those fights, right? There, There's very... There's you're very powerful in the early game, but there's very low margin for error. And it was it was beautiful the way they were playing it out at first. I think it was almost like a perfect early game for them. So I was really impressed. That's why I was like, you know, they were up four <coughs> zero eight minutes into this game. They had yeah. like killed the bottom lane, killed the top lane. Right. This is from somebody you'll know from CSGO, DDK, who's now in Valorant, but comes from CSGO, right? He actually had the best way of describing what you're talking about, Monty. So people know, because it was actually something you actually made, like sort of proliferated within early League of Legends, the premise of like the win condition, right? Here's what fa here's what pro players still don't actually discuss. What are our losing conditions? What DDK said is this. There's certain scenarios in a game where you have to know what players would lose you the game, and that's how you yeah. avoid them. Like, it's not just that you have to know what would the ideal scenario, but so in this case like that, it's the same as the obvious example, even as a layman would be if you're playing like some sort of fucking pork comp. It's like, well, we can't get this certain person caught at this point. And you know, you have to, yeah, that sort of has to be in the back of your mind, like a checklist in the same way as if you were the jungle or the sport, you're thinking in the back of your mind every five seconds, check the map, look, look at the other lane, you know, like it has to be part of your protocols, as you call it, you know, things you go through in the mental checklist. Because even in this final, like we say here, the team that ended up winning LCS had a basic premises to what they wanted to do that they weren't actually like adhering to essentially. And by the way, to spin that into a more general topic, unless you had something on that, basically I want to actually ask this because no one else seemed to discuss this at all aside from Cloud9 losing and then coming back to win. Dude, the most underwhelming part of this playoffs to me was where the fuck was Blabber? This is the guy we've just given the MVP because he smurfed on the whole league, could play any champion, did all the stuff he was doing last year in spring, just, just super aggressive, just dominate every other jungler, always jungle gap. When I watch these games, just like I criticise TSM, brother, you're playing against a sub and the sub is Grig. Like, you're the MVP. Now's your time to literally win the finals for your team. Mate, he was, it's not that he was even bad. He just wasn't blabber. Like, where's the guy who pops off? Where's the guy who takes over the game? He, was I think playing, probably, he, he plays way more conservative in playoffs, I think, unfortunately. I think probably is, you were talking about. probably is, like, I think the drafts of, like, the game three draft, I know we'll probably get into that one. That one just, for me, did was not good, like, compositionally, and it wasn't going to work well for him. Like, if he knocked her nulties in, like... Not only will like Thresh be there for a lantern on his target, probably be the Aphelios, GP ultimate to separate him from his team, or Yana Ball. Like there are just so many things that like, oh, he's just gonna die. Like that's just what's going to be. Um, and also like, yeah, you respected. Uh, he, he respected Armeo. Like I, I think Armeo is a good player, even though he's a sub, like 100, right? He's a sub that came in, but he like knew what his role was, and that's super important for someone to just come in, know their role. He like, I think he messed up like two times uh, this series. Um, I don't know if this was one in the series or if it was in the previous one where he like just died on wave, like trying to hold on as Udyr. And the other one was uh, game one when he tried to like help um, Sion push in the wave and then just died. So like those were two bad deaths. But overall, I think Armeo played well accordingly. And then Blabber um, game one was playing for team fight, and then like those that comp just like limited him. Game three he was just limited by the comp as well because like he's trying to play Nocturne Rel except like. With no follow up, <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I, I do think you have to give some big credit to Team Liquid's coaching staff here because that draft where they just blind the GP is such a fucking big dick move, and I loved it. I yeah. really enjoyed it because they're just saying they put their dick on the table, just slam it there, and they're like, "You have nothing that can beat this." So what's interesting about that is I think Cloud Nine got confused because they had here were their choices, guys. Their choices were pick something that actually synergizes that can dive with Rel and Nocturne in the team fight or Fudge gets shit on in lane. And so they had to make a very weird decision and they chose safer lane pick. We'll go with the Karma, but the Karma is not great with the rest of that composition. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, Victor and Karma kind of want to kite it out and Nocturne and Rel kind of want to go in there, right? Yeah. So I think it was, it, they put them in an awkward position. And then on top of that, Liquid basically denied the first three Nocturne Holts did nothing at all, like actually nothing. Sometimes like it would be like Jensen, you know, they saw Jensen admit he pops the ult and then Jensen just vanishes and he can't even like use the ability to get to Jensen. Um, 
or they were just trying to triage the other lanes because bot was getting slammed by the Aphilios and Thresh. So in my mind, I just really enjoyed Liquid's game plan here. And I think they they forced Cloud9 into a really, really awkward position, which is why Cloud9 banned the GP in the next two games. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I thought this was great from TL. Yeah, I, I think GP is one of those picks that like, he's actually it, remarkably strong as a laner. Like if you have a composition that's like a good team fight comp and you want to play towards the GP, like GP can do well in lane. Um, playing away from GP has its issues, but like, yeah, basically like, you can go not uh you can go karma you can go like a few picks into him but like if you want to play for lane karma is like a good pick um but like karma victor when your composition wants to dive in like you just said like good luck, <laughs> <laughs> good luck. well i mean so the, the answer to that question is right if you mm -hmm. want to succeed blabber must get fed in the early game so that he can one shot somebody by himself that really didn't happen and i think it was pretty doomed for for cloud nine beyond that point. And we're not even considering the fact too that it's not even the picks. It's the fact that Alfari is so fucking good at GP too. Yeah. Right? He's the best GP in NA. So I wouldn't want to play into that, right? So you're you're putting it on a power pick in the first place. But I just thought it was really interesting um, because I think they showed a draft strategy that most other teams picking both solo lanes, blue side, second rotation would have been unwilling to do, but was very effective when you get Oriana GP in this scenario. Hey, and you get to counterpick, uh, you know, your your dual lane. Like, you can just send your dual lane, like, get them to see the full composition. The moment you see Nocturne, I mean, people have been loving Nocturne. TSM, you know, was early picking Nocturne. Like, Nocturne is a flex. And in this game, I thought, sure. like, oh, he's flexible into mid lane as well. Um, the only thing, like, you can maybe put him into Oriana, but, like, it's not going to be, like, an ideal situation. Um, but, yeah, like, you, you, the moment you pick Thresh, and have like a, a a good range in the lane versus Kaisa. Like I that was really ingenious from team, team Liquid. Team Liquid, I think, like had a really like a great game plan that put them in a position to beat C9 with a sub. Like, talk about being given shit. <laughs> like not having <laughs> Santorin for your fucking finals and 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 you know the the, the semifinals before it. So I, you know, hands up, I, I, you know, a lot of appreciation to them. And uh, our male who came in. But, oh, for sure, yeah. mate. By the way, the real hero of the fucking weekend obviously was the coaching stuff for Team Liquid because whatever they told the team for these two series, like they didn't even play like a team that looked like they had a sub. They looked like they were like they really thought they could win these games. Yeah. And if we just do these certain things, we're going to be in them. And so, like I have to say, when I saw Jack do that statement on Twitter when the news first came out. Like, listen, every coach would do the same video, unfortunately, in the modern day. They'd just be like, no, the series isn't over and we believe in our sub. Like, listen, but the problem is that could all just be a bunch of nonsense you say for the camera. Dude, it actually looks like he believed it. So fair play. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that and that makes me think, by the way, he probably did a similar pretty good speech that was very rational, down to earth and connected with the players and the players bought into it because, dude, they almost won the LCS with a fucking sub. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I actually thought that some players really stood out. For me, um, I thought Jensen had a great series. Even though the beginning, the first game was really rough. <laughs> it was a, a rough-ass first game. Like, his Oriana in game three had, like, it was insane. I think his, um, damn, he had, like, a really good, I think it was TF game. Oh, no, 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 the TF no, game. No, was... no, 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 oh, no. No, 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 no. The Victor was the one where had, like, 10 kills. Victor, I think yeah. the Victor is another yeah. one. The Victor, the TF, the TF was a bad draft, by the way. So, no, so that one was a by, bad one. By the way, you know what's crazy about this series is yeah, that yeah. as we as we talk about game two, mm. there is a real possibility that this was a 3-0 TL because C9 almost threw the ever-loving shit out of that game. They did. Because they they had such an insane advantage because they were up a huge amount. The TF yeah. had done nothing into the mid game, which is you can't. if you if if your TF isn't doing anything by the mid game, it you're, you're it's an uphill battle, right? And mm -hmm. then the combination of like C9 fighting and not even using their like Bronzodia composition ultimates, like they were dying without even using Malphite ult, ult or Oriana ult, right? And even when they were using them, like Perks's Oriana was bad. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I, I was really, I was shocked that that game was even competitive after the early game. It was insane. I, they, they, I think Team Liquid should have won, which is the craziest thing because yeah. Twisted Fate is is trapped in this comp. He cannot go top lane in the Malphite as long as if Malphite plays respectfully early, then suddenly that's like such a hard dive. He can't go bot lane versus like 
Rakan and cleanse AD carry. You, like you'd have to set up for it. And if you set up like well enough, maybe you can get the dive, of course. But like most of the time, the TF is in a really rough spot. And then the, finally they get a TF port on to the jungle when they're going on Udir. Um, and then they die for it. So like this was like one of those moments where I was like, okay, so this is an easy win. Like just comp alone for C9. And then they get they catch them out top lane once, they catch them out mid lane again. Like, you know, Zven's just fucking dying to these get uh these plays. I was like, okay, wait a minute. This is a huge lead for um, yes. for Team Liquid. They should literally win off this lead. And then there was one fight in particular that I remember around Baron. And it was the stu- It was so fucking... Okay. Imagine you're a Sivir. You're the AD carry. You're walking into this object. Like, you don't have much vision, sure. You press... You you put your ward in Pixel Bush. You see a Malphite just standing there. <laughs> Looking you down. Like, I need to get past this guy. We probably should, like, focus him down. Like, at least play for the fight if we can't take the objective. And basically, he, like, point blanks ulties al- alongside the Hecarim multi. Sivir has flash. If you can flash this, the team could play around it. At least play for the fight. And they lose this fight because Sivir just gets one shot. So that one was uh, that one was a rough one. Um, the setup, I'm pretty sure, is something you can criticize. But even in that moment, I was like, you just died to literally all of the information that you had on the table right in front of you. So, yeah. And that goes into game four, too, because it was another instance of of uh, tactical kind of getting caught out because that was yeah. another game that it looked like it was going to go south for C9 super fast, right? And yeah. then, holy shit, the Zoe bubble from Perks manages to hit the Zaya in the middle of the composition. And to, T- or to C9's credit, the up was also amazing when they realized that that bubble had hit and they just yeah. dumped the Hecarim and, and Gragas ultimates on top of the Zaya before she could like get out of it. But yeah. if that bubble doesn't hit, I think C9 loses this series. They lose it. They for sure lose it. And like that was not the first time. I think there was a, the fight before that too. When uh, Zven assassinated the Zaya, I think she walked into bubble. <laughs> like, oh, to look back at that one. But she definitely got slept when she shouldn't have gotten slept. And they were winning that fight. So it was like two fights in a row where, you know, Tactical is the target. He gets picked off like by Zoe Wobble. The first one was pretty bad. The second one was, that one is rough. That's unlucky. Yeah, that one he just didn't see it, and he was like in the middle of two other players, like I, yeah. there's no reasonable way he could have predicted that that would hit him. While he's walking away, it's like the nar that's in the way. So if I, if you're playing in that position, you're like this bubble is not going to hit me. But the moment it gets thrown out, nar is out of the way. You're literally the target. <laughs> so like uh, that one's just, that one's tough. He's definitely thinking about. It. He even tweeted about it too. I'm pretty sure about like his deaths yesterday. So like those are the moments that you just kind of like you it hurts because you have the draft. The gameplay is looking great under the circumstances, like the shittiest circumstances alive and Team Liquid could have done it. Yeah, and this this is why I, I'm really like concerned about C9 because mm. game one, they definitely should have won and they threw it. Uh, game three, they definitely should have, uh, that was the TF game. Yes, that's one that probably should have lost. Yeah, the TF, no, game two, game two, the TF game. They were had a huge lead and then they almost threw it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Game three, I think, was just r- really well played by Team Liquid, and they kind of had things on lock and, and had a very cool draft. Game four, Team Liquid should have won and did like, and TM, TL threw it. And then game five, this is the one where Cloud9 was just like that. To Flash. me, this was, the, this was the only game that Cloud9 actually played well throughout this entire series. Uh, but but it was, also, by the way, think about this, because I don't know if you noticed this sentiment. As soon as the lock-in began, because, like, listen, there's a, there's a trend that everyone knows, which is a lot of the NA people, obviously these people are on the, broad, on the show with me right now excluded, but a lot of NA people, it's not that they're, like, totally insecure, but they always try to, like, mildly downplay a lot of the best EU people. I know a lot of people, this is what triggers them about Mark, so he does do it a lot. Like, you always find some angle to, like, not believe that, like, Caps could be as good as, like, Showmaker or something. You know, like, there's always some angle he has, right? So I know a lot of people were, like, low-key sort of, like, looking for any flaws in perks at all. So even in the lock-in, people were making fun of some of the picks and how he played out. Anytime Cloud9 ever lost a game or came close to looking not that good, they would comment, oh, it's not stomping. They, basically, they set like an impossible precedent for him to have to reach because he's supposed to be the Western GOAT. You know, he's got all those titles and a lot of people, sadly, because he played ADC, don't really know Perk's mid lane style. So stupidly, they think he's supposed to be caps and that he just, you know, fucking 1v1 and solo kills you 24-7 and robes the whole map. That was like never Perk's game anyway. But I'll tell you what, everyone who laughed at the price tag that Jack played or what he tried to do in this offseason 
know, maybe they're just a TSM fan, so they just laugh at anything, apparently, except themselves. They don't have mirrors in their houses. They're all vampires. They were never alive anyway. What's <laughs> not, not dead man ever die? So when they do this, right, I tell you what, if you all were laughing, you weren't laughing in this game, were you? Because this game, Jack may as well have just basically just sat back like this, like, all right, this is why I got you. Go on then. And then he just <laughs> literally shit on your soul. Like, you, Tim Lick wasn't even in this game. This is ridiculous. It was so And it's so not, by the way, good. it's not like all the kills he got were just easy. It was like going for fucking kill. He was like flash to win and shit. Like, this is legit, this game. This is a this was what you expect when you bring someone like that to this region. The, 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 the level one was just a thing of beauty. You know, it's not the first time, obviously, that we've seen some of these, like, level one Scion tricks. Like, this is kind of a classic. But mm. the way they... I mean, it, it could not have gone better. Like Alfari walking up to the the wave as Cho'Gath, right? Uh, which which definitely resulted in his death, and then like snowballed into a second death. Uh, it the fact that the draft. So what was so cool, I think, about this is that they didn't even think they were going to kill Alfari level one. I think they thought they were going to kill Alfari level two with Alistair and Tristana. Once you have the Alistair combo and you have the the jump as well on Tristana, right? So. The fact that they got it level one gifted to them and then also were able to get a kill level two, I, I think it was at level two, it was level two or three, was just absolutely nuts for Cloud9. Yeah. The fact that they got all like three quarters of the jungle for free, uh, the fact that Fudge had the level advantage, even things like the response was super weird because they sent Core JJ top lane this this was the, like the worst part so they send core jj top lane with alfari right so it's a 1v1 between tactical on kaisa and fudge on scion in the bot lane which turns into a 2v2 with the junglers but blabber already has such an insane advantage and he's playing you know udier or with an edge early yeah. on yeah. so you're just not going to win that 2v2 and then liquid opt into that 2v2 and then die there as well meanwhile perks as you're saying is just going nuts in the mid lane like this game the gameplay, it could not have gone more perfectly for Cloud9. This is the shit you dream of, of from it, a level one. It's amazing because, like, just conceptually, if you play it perfectly, like, there are ways you can deal with a Scion doing this, of course. Like, if you, you just don't expect it because, A, Scion is just a, a pick. Like, people will just pick Scion in any composition. It's not going to tip a hat in, in what they're going to try and do. Um, like, people will talk about Tristana, but, like, you can do that with any, uh, you know, pushing AD. So... Um, you know, hats off to the coaching staff like Vegar, uh, V2, Max, uh, Rainover, Mithy. Like, they got coach of the split. A lot of the times they like to meme the shit out of it because it's literally just the first place team that gets of it. Of course, yes. Yeah. And it technically did happen here, but like, I think it was still deserving. I, I think like they deserved it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, this was great. It's going to instantly give your jungle a huge advantage because now it's, you just, you know, you, you took three quadrants. Uh, Hacker Room has is literally nothing. Like, the enemy jungle, like, Armeo has nothing to work with. Um, and the top lane has advantage because like Cyan gets full. <laughs> like while well, well, even even if Chogad didn't die, like he just he can't actually have access to the wave while Cyan is going to have access um eventually and has now like jungle creeps underneath him. So like I thought it was a really ingenious one. You're eventually going to swap back. I remember Rogue did this um like previous year, and it, it, it's something that was done previous. I think Pentana in Australia also did this in Oceania. It's, it's something where it's like they had it in, they said that they had the, the strat and they were just willing, waiting for like a right time to use it. And goddamn, <laughs> it's like it was you know, literally the last with the, instance. With, with the comps that they had and everything, it just couldn't have been a better time to use it, right? When you have the stronger early game jungler, you have a, a limited mobility top laner. You, not only that, but just the circumstances. You're playing yeah. against the sub jungler who is definitely going to be thrown for a loop about what to do in this game. Because you're trying to play, if you're liquid, you're trying to play as standard as possible and you don't have perfect comms because there's a new guy in there, especially a guy who is crucial to early game comms in the jungle position, right? Right? Mm -hmm. And so then you just throw everything into chaos. And how do you even deal with this? Right. Uh, you get all these kills just raining in across the map. You're making poor decisions about where to send your jungler later on, which is resulting yeah. in more deaths for your team. I mean, this was truly like this was one of the most, I, I think, conceptually solid and perfect executions of a level one that I have ever, ever, ever seen. I mean, it was real. But Monty, it was in the LCS, so everyone just says all the games are trash. What are you doing right now? Don't you know Koreans play that? No, no, whatever, yeah. <laughs> Look, I don't know if they considered all of these factors when they decided to pull the trigger on this strategy, but 
for all intents and purposes, it was a perfect. They should crash. say they did, by the way, just for the yeah. sake of like the story. Just say you planned it all. It was like 500 IQ. It was like fucking like whatever episode 14 of Death Note or something. Like that. <laughs> all according to a cat or whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. It was really great. Um, so like this, it's it's games like these where now I started dreaming about like okay, what can Cloud9 actually do in MSI? Um, like versus like the top teams, LPL, LCK, because um, yeah, I mean North America. I, I said this when I was on broadcast, but like competition is what matters like a competition within your own region so like if you're being challenged consistently and then also just like theory crafting you need to be able to think about like a game on a deeper level um and i thought this was a really really well thought out game and it shows that when they're in practice when they're in scrims they're like thinking of like ways to kind of abuse the patch or what they can what can they actually do that the enemy team may not expect so Bring me them best of ones. <laughs> bring me, bring me the the international best of ones. That's what people should be hearing. <laughs> I've got a piece of trivia for you that might actually blow your mind because not many people have actually ever sat down and really thought about what this means, right? In, in the context of what we've just discussed. So I'll actually ask you. I'll see if you know. So either of you can answer this question, right? Perks is considered by many the Western goat. I mean, you just look how many times he's bloody won the LCS, LC, LE, LCS slash LEC. He's won MSI. He's obviously got a fantastic record at Worlds, even though he hasn't won it. Like, unbelievable. Like, he's always been in two MSI finals. If people don't know, he was in the one when Mithy was still in the team. Like, a ridiculous resume, right? In fact, he's almost like the consensus. It's basically, unless you just, like, have recency bias, you just think the last few years of Caps is better. It's between Caps and... and um, Perks for most people, right? So do either of you know what career accomplishment that a player can have is he missing? Do you, do any of you know? As well, the GOAT? No, 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 not that one, obviously. Has that, he never like been MVP of a He's season. never won a single MVP in his whole that's career. Crazy. You ready for the second detail? The second detail <laughs> is the killer, that, a The second one is the killer. It's That's not it in itself. By the way, that in itself, absurd. So you're the GOAT, but not for one split ever. Did people ever think you were the best player? That's nuts, but the second one's mental. His jungler has won the MVP four times. <laughs> and they were three different people. <laughs> it was Trick, Yankos, and now Blabber. Interesting. This guy's so good, you all think the other guy's the best. He makes the other guy look so good, you give him the fucking MVP. <laughs> How salty does it, does Perks have to be at this point? Well, here's the thing. I'm sure he's such a G. He's the guy where it's like, I'll just take the trophy and all the money and the goat status, and you guys can have the MVP. You know what, actually, Trick? You keep those two MVPs, mate. I'll take MSI. You know, I'm sure he just does that instead. Like, See, see, for me, Perks is undeniably the GOAT Western player. Like, I don't even... I, I, in my mind, it's not really particularly close. Especially because he's got the intangibles, hasn't he? So he's exactly. kind of like got the complete package. I mean, yeah. he even, in this tournament, again, maintained that bonkers Game 4 record. I'll probably do a piece on it soon. Off the top of my head, I think his Game 4 record over his career in Best of 5 series is something mental. Like, it's going to now be like 28 and 5 or something nuts. Like, <laughs> humans don't do this. Like, I mean, even, I'm not even joking. Go to any region. Even go to some region you don't respect. Like, I'm not fucking PCS. I'll guarantee there's no player with a record like this. Like, on, on any contextual like relative level that is nuts that you just always give him game four no matter what especially when especially when he created in this game that they should have lost he created the play he had that the won game, them play, game yeah four. he had the turnaround it. play exactly i mean that's that a legendary it. that's gonna go down as a legendary play it's yes. just so stupidly unlikely that he was able to do that bubble that is, a, that is a crazy play considering people have just run this meme slash trope into the ground that is the actual appropriate moment where you show that initial sequence where they come in the mid lane, Monty, and then just as that bubble hits fucking tactical, you pause it, you go, eh, you pull the fucking record off and go, you're probably wondering how I got here. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly, that's the one time that meme's appropriate because I bet he was thinking that, like, I was supposed to win the LCS off this shit. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> even I was surprised I hit this bubble. <laughs> By the way, even that, even that in itself is an intangible, which is, look, here's the thing about Perks. He's not the guy who just dominates from minute one to the last minute of the game. He doesn't even do it in series. But at the right moments, the key moments, that's when he always turns up. That is an intangible because it sounds so easy. It sounds like something everyone wants to say, like the right players. And they're like, no, there's a lot of really, really great players, some of the best players ever, where, like, Uzi Ai is probably one of my favorite examples. You know how many times Uzi Ai was, like, the best player in the but then on game five, it just went bad. 
Like, yeah. lots of times, you know. Like, it's, he actually zigged when he should have zagged many times. So, Perks not only has, like, the skill set, the fucking leadership, all the, he also is, like, one of these motherfucking players that just looks like they're, like, guided by destiny, like some mad shit, like it's in the fates that he just <laughs> has to win these tournaments. And so he just, like, knows how to, like, get out the way and go, yeah, let's do whatever God wants. Oh, win the game. Yeah, why not? Thank you. Indeed, I will. I think I will, sir. I thought his response in the interview afterwards of, like, like saying, oh, you know, he, I think he said he felt bad for Alfari, like that he just kind of cucked him in another finals, but he, or at least an, another championship. But it was like, oh, you know how perfect that is. This is when like, you're god tier, is when you start actually being, you not only win and beat the guy, you then also publicly express sorrow for him that you have to win the championship. <laughs> that's fucking, that's actually better than trash talk. It's so good. It's, he's saying, I'll play top lane next split. And I was like, come on, man, stop this. <laughs> oh, wait. That wasn't all he did, because if people don't know, I'll quickly find it now. But like, he also then went and within, listen, this is like fresh off winning as well. Because when, and we'll talk about it soon, in LEC, obviously Mad Lions won. And so Kazi decided, because they used to be AD carry rivals, Kazi decided to do a tweet, right? And he said, like, you know, like at MSI, I'm going to shit stomp you or whatever to perks or like a time to shit stomp or whatever. And they'll find it here, what exactly he said. Where's the exact quote? He said he got delete, Dassy. No, no, no. Uh, Perk said that uh, Carzy got ADC gapped in five out of five games. Yes, there we <laughs> Which go. Which is true. Uh, the, the it was, not only was it true, was... But, but that's exactly how when like some young bucks just on the way up and you're like the fucking king of the game and you're on top. It's like they come up like, man, I challenge you. You're like, get the fuck down, peasant. Like, I love that <laughs> shit. Because it was so ruthless. It was so ruthless. Because the best part is, like you said, Monty, the key to banter, if people don't know, is you just got to get the right angle to the banter. Because the angle there is sick because Kazi can't say shit about that. Like, he's actually... It's not like... Because any other angle, right? Kazi could be like, you don't even play my position anymore, or I won't away, or I'm in EU, yeah. and that's about the more than an A. So he found the one angle, which is like, look, mate, I basically won my team the final. You just watched your team win the final. Like, that's fucking God <laughs> say. Like, you can't say anything. You have, if you're Kazi, you have to go, right, at this point, my only actual option left is I have to actually just beat him at MSI. Like, yep. there's nothing I can do now, yeah. No. <laughs> he wins this one, all right? One for him, you know? All right, I'll take that. Damn, I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> see you then <laughs> oh that was great apparently he deleted the tweet that's that's what i'm getting yes here. that's why so, i couldn't find it before yeah but i do remember what nice I, said. I had a good laugh i had a good yeah, laugh over that Damn. One. um i don't know why he deleted it it was good <laughs> so i don't think there's anything wrong with it yeah um okay we gotta we gotta wrap up this segment with you raz but i do want to get your take on on msi so Keeping in mind that Cloud9 had a masterpiece of a game five, but yep. was pretty shaky the rest of the games. Um, arguably, you know, could have very easily lost this series 3 0 uh, against a sub jungler. Yeah. I, I outlined some of the problems I think they have with their synergy with Blabber and Fudge in some of these mm -hmm. team fights. I also think that this is a team with a very high ceiling. So by going to MSI and practicing against better teams, I think they will improve dramatically. Yeah. Um, what do you think C9's kind of upper and lower limits at MSI are? Because I think they're going to do okay. Yeah, upper limits, like, if I'm just peak, oh, they're just hitting all, like, on every corner. Um, like, I still think that whoever go, goes out of LPL finals and LCK finals will be better. I mean, we already sure. know that one. So, like, I think it'll, it won't even be top two. Uh, probably top three. I still need to see Mad Lions uh, series because that was happening at the same time. Yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah, I, I want to see. What, yeah, so I really want to see that with how they can do lower limits. Um, man, I don't think they can get that low. That's the thing about MSI. I think MSI there are just so many regions. Like, it's only top one of every region, and I think every region has like its own huge ass issues. So, like, um, really, it's just about the top five, uh, four or five regions. So I think uh, it's realistic to think that the worst they can go is like fourth place. I would even I wouldn't even give like maybe PCS, um, but I would have to once again I would have to watch that. Um, but I'm a little skeptical. But yeah, I would say I would say around uh, fourth place. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the window for them is actually super narrow. Like yeah. I think the. Third, third is probably best, and fourth is probably worst. I don't. Are you yeah. ready for the statement? No one's going to be able to All handle. Right. So I'll have to be the one who does it. As All bloody right. usual, <laughs> then shall I? All right, are you ready? Listen, I know we're about to get into it, so I'll just feed him a little bit now, and we'll see what he says when he comes on. Mad lions have, have no fucking experience. 
like, listen, one of them's never been to anything like Worlds or MSI. One of them went from a shit region where you never really get to, like, have a chance to do anything. Three of them got banged out in the fucking part where they were supposed <laughs> to get to the real tournament. And technically, in a colloquial sense, they are all rookies. Like, them winning, them even being in the final of LEC was a surprise. Them winning was a surprise. Like, listen, props to them. But you know what? You go look at Cloud9, everyone's going to laugh. <laughs> LCS is way worse than LEC. That's because you were all, as I've been telling you on the show for the last last year constantly making it that lec equals g2 esports no lec yep. doesn't and as you know it's g2 esports aren't g2 esports anymore <laughs> so i've got to tell you guys there is a world in which i could see cloud nine placing ahead of mad lions i'm not saying it necessarily happens i'd have to really get in dive and figure out what yeah. I, it's not implausible though so there's a yep. world in which like like i don't know listen i'll be realistic it's probably impossible to beat damn one i suspect whoever wins lpl will also be off limits for the best of five but Actually, that EU match suddenly got a lot more interesting than back when it was G2 for the last two years. I agree. Absolutely. Like, that's a one matchup that I hope we can end up getting. I'd love to see that. Yeah, it'd be awesome. It's one of the saddest things about Worlds that people don't know on MSI. I've said this many times, Monty. In my opinion, the real victim of those fucking, um, the system where Worlds, like you can't have the different regions in the groups, which always ends up with just Asian teams come first in the group, basically, is we never, ever get the matchups that we could have had these last years that we never get like Cloud9 versus like Fnatic. That doesn't happen in like a best of five. You don't get like TSM versus, I mean, TSM don't make it out of groups, but you know what I mean? Like you don't get, you don't get like, a, those would be some of the most tight matchups ever. Like if G2 had played against fucking Team Liquid, but like in like, like the semis of fucking, I mean, I know they also don't make it up, but you get the premise, like the best teams. Like that never, you never, you very rarely ever got like Western versus Western. It was just always, can any of us sort of not get totally dominated by this Asian team? Like, give me a break. This is a shit storyline, guys. Like, it's good for you if you like the Asian teams, but we actually missed that. So I hope this is the one where we finally get it. Yeah, 100%. I, I think that one's going to be the best series if we end up getting between uh, Mad Lions. And, hey, and I keep saying, best of ones, maybe they can get something on uh, the LPL They're team. They're always upsets in best oh, the of LPL, ones. Exactly. Every of single time. Like That's why yeah. nobody can predict Worlds groups properly. Especially for online order. again as well. Let's throw that in the mix as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Raz. We got to get over to Mac now and talk about LEC. Appreciate your time coming on the yeah. show. Great job thanks, on the finals. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Right, we're here for the last segment, third segment, and it's going to be with Mac here from Mad Lions, obviously the newly crowned LEC champions. So I have a very interesting question for you at the beginning. It's almost like I'm doing one of those like high school fucking essays where, you know, I'm getting extra marks by actually questioning the premise at the beginning, right? This might sound controversial, Mac. It shouldn't be. We live in an ordinary world, but Riot Games exist. So I have to keep that in mind, right? <laughs> Technically, because Peter Dunn was there last year, I know a lot of people are confused, actually. Like, what was the hierarchy? Like, I know he was had one of those titles where it's almost like the GM title. It's like director of esports or something. You know, something like that was his title, wasn't it? Uh, theoretically, Peter was the head coach of the League of Legends franchise, and I was the head coach of the League of Legends, of the LEC team. Uh, right, because I heard, right. though, something along Got the it. lines of, like, part of the reason it had to be phrased that way was, like, based on, you know, like, something like who gets, like, for Riot listed as the head coach and who gets to be on stage as well. So, Because wasn't basically Peter Dunn sort of the head coach and you were sort of, like, under him last year, but now you're, like, now you've sort of taken his mantle. Something along those lines. Give us the, clarify it if you can. So, last year, basically, uh, there's there's a lot of context around this, but in the past, I never thought I could be a head coach. I don't really talk about this that much, but I, we're, we're going to open a whole can of worms here or whatever. Oh, right. boy. I kind of, uh, like, I have had a lot of problems with chronic injuries or chronic pain or whatever you want to call it in the past. Um, basically, I had, like, super bad tendonitis, which turned into really bad RSI injuries in both my arms, in both sides, and it's kind of a bit messed up. And I never had an official diagnosis for it, and it's a bit spread to other places in my body so it's really affected by stress so uh a lot of the time in the first couple of years in lec when i wasn't managing it properly i was in a lot of pain um and so i really doubted my ability to actually <laughs> if you have a stress related injury I'm not, I'm not necessarily <laughs> sure like head coach of league legends team is you know yeah, best yeah, job for someone yeah. with a stress related injury you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah exactly so um <laughs> however makes um, sense the opportunity that i got for mad lions was basically that um peter wanted me to give it a shot uh and for me to be able to do that 
uh, and actually be the head coach of the LEC team in the in the strategic sense, right? Like leading all the scrims and yes. the culture and all that type of stuff. Peter would then deal with everything else around it, right? So right. he did a lot of the off-season stuff. He did a lot of the communication with the upper management. He did a lot of, like, for example, he went on a lot of shows and stuff like that to like yes, set narratives course. and things like this, right? He did all of, like, he did, uh, he led the academy project. He trained our academy coaches. Like he mentored me and gave me loads of guidance, right? So he did, he did like literally everything he could to take pressure off of me to see if I could actually be a good head coach. Uh, so game five, uh, how are you feel? We'll see if today? you make it. <laughs> <laughs> After that game five, how, I, that must have been an unreal amount of stress. <laughs> that whole series must have been stress, Monty. He was down 0-2, and then in game three, it also looked like it was just 3-0 already, didn't it? Like, And by the way, I will say, even though you don't think about it in the moment, like we'll never, ever be able to get away from this, because no matter what you say about the upper bracket and the advantages, if you are the team that's from the upper bracket final and you haven't lost yet, it never will feel nice that you could just get 3 0 and lose the whole Tournament. Like I'll just never feel yeah, good. Like yeah, you already feel sure. like I I have to just win now because I'm like I don't get the extra life. So I'm sure that entire series was stressful as fuck in the whole circumstance. Even though at the end I'm sure the payoff was incredible as a result. So I'm shattered today, but that's mostly just because I was running on the high from winning till like 7 a.m. last night, and then I slept for like two hours because I just woke up and had the game running through my head, you know. And I just woke <laughs> up like, how the fuck did we win that game? What the hell? <laughs> I'm um, so confused as well. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Dude, because yeah. obviously you were actually in the server and all this, right? During the entire game on Twitter, right? Because I was out at the time most of the game five was taking part. I was just looking for updates, right? Dude, every time on Twitter, it was just all the people I know on my timeline discussing who from Rogue should win the MVP. And then so eventually, right, when I did the final refresh, I was like, right, so Rogue's probably won. So I was preparing my tweet and I was like, how was Mad Lions won the game though? Like... The entire timeline was just people. Should it be Trimby? I think actually maybe it should be like this is rental <laughs> mate. No, like oh, I'm no. summer gap the whole time. Like what? All right. My my story about that game five was uh, I saw I saw Rogue get the Baron at 20 minutes right, and so I just walk away from my TV. It's in and I go to the next room because I was making some some Sichuan chicken for dinner. So I'm sitting there just with my wok, you know, stir frying up some dinner, and then I finish dinner. And then I walk back in and you guys are destroying Rogue's base. And I just am like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> so obviously I went back and watched, watched it all later, but it was deeply confusing at the time as to what was going on. I was literally shouting at my wife being like, how the fuck did this happen? What, what is going on? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, not at my wife, but uh, at my assistant coaches. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I mean, Senna only had like 150 stacks at like 20 minutes or something. So, I, don't, I don't know what the number was. I'm making it up, but it was it was ridiculous. Um, that, that game was really ridiculous. How many, what, put it this way, here's the fun one, right? If you had to give us at that point in the game, what, what's the chances that your team still wins the game if we play that like 100 times or something? What, how many times do you think you win? Point three percent. We're not even going one percent. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But he, he went, as soon as he said point, I think it was over already. Yeah, buddy, yeah. So he had to bring decibels into it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was. It was it's certainly funny a because we've won so many games on stage now. A lot of them against Rogue, actually, that we would have FF'd in scrims by that point. Like we'd be like, okay, all oh, right. Like, we don't. We don't. We don't normally FF at games in scrims. Like we fight back a lot. Right. Uh, but like that was that would be one of the games where it'd be like, yeah, okay, this one's probably fine. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. I mean, I, I don't want to take away from from what especially Humanoid and Arma did in that last game, because, I mean, the, the combination of Nar ults and like Victor uh, gravity wells or gravity fields, whatever that ability is called, the kind of chain stun that they did was really well played. Right. And the, the fact that you guys took the fights in the terrain that was suited to you. I think it was masterfully played out for for you, given the scenarios that you were presented. But big, big throw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but even that being said as big of a throw as it was i don't think you win without also playing out those scenarios almost perfectly so it was it was definitely a combination of of those two things um that that picked up the victory but, but it's weird there almost should be a saying for that because that can't just be called a throw because as you say it's not like the initial thing loses you the game for me the yep. throw is like you threw the game that's like they threw it and then fucking mad lions caught it and ran with it there you go that's yes. just some like we have to have some two parts of that analogy or something but, but it had to be multiple throws and then mad lions also had to catch it perfectly multiple times so it, there was there was a lot of poise i think for mad lions in that situation uh in order to carry you back out from a what almost 8,000, I think, gold deficit or whatever it was yeah. 
you know, 25 minutes into the game. Uh, like before for this way, I, I have to say, I know for all, cause none of them have been in finals. A lot of them were like super emotional, but if I was a player for rogue there, that has to be one of the worst ways you could ever lose a fucking series. <laughs> like that, especially if it was some of the ones that like, some of them are young and have never been there. If you are I'm there, you think, right, this is the, this is that, this is, it's a movie. This is the payoff for all those years, you know, like, dude, that's one of those ones where even though, even though fans won't believe this is real, as a player, you're only human. When you're in the lead, you start thinking things like, we might win this game. And then what would that mean? if we, these, these thoughts creep in your head. Like, so I, I can see why they were just destroyed after that one. That was one of the craziest yeah. ends to an LEC ever. Yeah, I think game, game three was really rough on their mental strength as well. I felt, I felt like by the end of the series, they were kind of just like done mentally, honestly. Um, but I think like in addition to the, the throwing analogy we have, I think you also have to factor in a degree of proactivity from us, right? Like it's not just catching the throw, it's actually like setting up to be able to force mistakes, right? Which sure. is something that we were really, really good at. Um, like like we were seven K goal down at ten like no was it seven K at ten minutes? Something insane. It might have been five K at ten minutes, but uh, the goal lead, like didn't move. Uh, like we managed to get the second herald for some reason, but that's because we're being proactive and willing to react, right? Like the whole time that we're there, we're saying we're going to do this. If they give us this, then we have this angle back into the game. We're going to take. The, we're going to go for this herald. If they come, then we're going to drop it and we're going to push out bot side instead and blah blah blah. Like we always had a plan that was really proactive, and like the the final Baron fight that ends the game. I think we're six K behind when we force the Baron, right? Like, I don't think there are that many teams in Europe that will do that. Yeah, uh, who who is making those calls? Who is making those uh, calls on your team? Mostly Yoya and Humanoid, and to a certain extent Kazi as well. I would say they're, they're for sure the three most vocal players when it comes to late game shot calling around objectives. Has that changed then? Because I know when you talked to people last year from Mad Lions, they actually said last year, because everyone else was like technically a rookie except Humanoid. I mean, by my reckoning, they're all rookies. But, you know, by like the strict rules of how you classify a rookie, since they were all rookies, I heard from most of the players that like Humanoid just did like loads of the shot calling in that team. Like, Has it changed then in that sense? Like, Is that something that bringing El Yoya in, for example, has been different? Because I have to say, he's one of the players where I didn't have like super high expectations, but the playoff performance has been fantastic so far. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole point of bringing in Yoya in the first place, right? Like, the, the niche that we wanted him to fill was someone that could be uh, a leader in the early game because oh, last right. year we felt like... We felt like... Um, like, Marek, Humanoid, is really good at late-game shot calling, but in the early game, he likes to focus a lot on his lane. Uh, Understandably, and... yeah, he's a mid laner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of important. Um, and that meant that the only really, really early-game vocal player we had uh, that was like really kind of authoritative and commanding as a as a play caller was Kazi, and that put like an insane amount of pressure on Kazi to shot call the early game, and also for us to like we we were really shoehorned into playing strong side bot lane like every single game. Makes and sense. Strong yes. side bot lane, we were just doomed. Yes. Um, you also had a Roman so... which helped to make that decision easier. So. Well, listen, they uh, don't say that name anymore, Monty. That, listen, there is there is no such person as redacted Rome, redacted Shadow. Those players don't exist, Monty. Those players, let's just quietly pretend it's the same team. You move on. So. so that was that was the whole logic about bringing Yoya in, right? Was to take pressure off of Kazi, and this is something that when we had like our big slump in summer last split. It, like a, a big part of it was Kazi. Like I, I remember him turning around to me like one day and me being like, "Are you all right? Like you're not talking that much in the early game. Like what's happening?" And him just being like, "I just can't do it anymore. Like I just feel so much pressure to to like shot call every game, and I just can't do it." Um, and that's you know, it was his rookie year, and it's a lot even in even in a veteran team. Like that's just too much responsibility for one person to shoulder in the early game. Um, so yeah, that was that's the the whole logic of bringing Yoya in in the first place, and he's done an insane job. Like his transition to the LEC has been incredible, and in terms of like the ability to be proactive in big games on stage, like this guy has never played on a stage before in his life. Not like never played on yeah. a big stage, never played like LEC finals, like like ever. Like not like a, a, a regular season SLO game in Spain, like never. Uh, and he comes onto his first stage game ever, and is like, as, like uh, this guy's. And a let's, let's let's like, let's recount those. Let's you know just for posterity. Let's recount those stage games because they were Rogue win, G two win, Rogue again win. 
And those were so, the top two teams in the league, if people don't know. <laughs> and he had to take out Rogue yeah. twice. And not only that, you know, we, we've discussed this a, a little bit when we had Kaiser on the show as well, which is that what I loved about your first series versus Rogue is that I feel like you guys took the Volibear buffs on this patch and then you applied them as a counter to Rogue's playstyle. But the only way that that works is if El Yoya is doing big, big dick plays, like flashing from the Raptor pit into mid lane to kill Larson under the turret and to have that be his first series to have the expectation be we are playing around you and this champion that we think can disrupt rogues play style and you have to make very risky plays that you cannot fuck up uh was extremely impressive to me that he pulled that off yeah yeah and in game five uh, against rogue it's the same right like the reason that we're so far behind in the game is because we die with the renekton at level three we're like lucian uh like rice has tp like he can be there rice has tp he can be there we're like, ah, we can one shot the guy like let's go let's do it we can we don't know where the juggler is but we can one shot him and get out for sure like we don't but the yeah. fact that we have the the balls to do that is just is just insane also like obviously a major factor to coming back in this series was that as people may know, one of the very interesting details about getting armor into the team is because he can play Wukong, and that was already a bizarre off matter fucking pick that Kaiser, in theory, can play if he had to. Is like <laughs> you have like the maddest flex, and every time he got it as a top lane champ, he's already looked amazing on it every time. That must just be his champion, right, man? Like he looks like he can't lose when he plays it. Yeah, he he has a special Wukong buff. Like in in the it was a, it was game three that we played Wukong. Yeah, yeah, yes, like. He's looking at their champions. He's like, yeah, Wukong's pretty good into their champions. And I'm like, what about the Karma matchup? He's like, it's completely unplayable. Okay. Pick me Wukong. Okay. <laughs> like, nice comment to like, say when you're at elimination point, you first LEC <laughs> fan. You know what? I'll take Wukong, I think, in this particular game, sir. <laughs> All right, then. Like, I, think, I think at the beginning of the game, Kazi was like, or Yoya was like, what's up playing matchup like Karma? And he just goes, doomed. <laughs> okay <laughs> but, but like that that's one of the great things about armor is that he just has this insane confidence um and i think that he had also had the read that we had that we felt like rogue weren't able to punish us in the early game uh and we felt like they were actually not performing that well under the pressure either and that as the series went on they were kind of playing worse and getting less confident uh, and he had the balls to do something like that, right? And when you do something like that, you force your opponent to punish you for it. And yes. if your opponent is in a bad place mentally, then it puts all of the pressure on them to be proactive, and that's the last thing that you want. Uh, and so we just have to sit back and scale, and then he just has to play his favorite champion <coughs> in team fights and 1v9 them, right? That's one of the reasons, by the way, why I know this might sound weird, even though individually for the players as like humans and some of them with their career narratives, I do feel sorry for the rogue players to lose in those circumstances. One of the ways I can't feel that much sympathy is this is literally the MO of rogue as well, though. They're such a good fucking front running team. And when people like Larson or uh, fucking inspired, when they have their champions and the game's going well, yeah, they'll, they'll win a game against almost any team. They could beat some of the Asian teams. But I tell you what, when they're behind in games or when uh, someone starts coming back against them they have to be one of the most mentally brittle teams i've ever seen like you can almost like bank on the idea they're going to give you a chance to get back in the game like they're not going to stop when they've got their foot on your throat they don't just put you out you know yeah they definitely are slow that was our big read on them was that they were slow and that they wouldn't actually punish us early like some of the drafts that we had like on paper some of the drafts that we had were, were terrible like really terrible like which ones do you think were the worst no did prior, you know going uh... in that some of them were going to be like this like was it like an anticipation <laughs> we might have to play some bad drafts or did it just go badly in the draft phase i mean we we thought that we could scale against them kind of for free in a lot of senses right. um the only problem that we thought was that uh like their big early win condition is that if inspired has a bunch of prior and he can invade you then he'll just like take every blue buff and it's really annoying right they have this like set piece that they run where they take every single blue buff they get mid lane prior then they take the herald then they drop it for mid then they take the mid tower which is what happened game one against uh against them in our first playoff run right uh first playoff series um so that was the big thing coming into that that, that we were worried about in, in the early game but in terms of them actually snowballing with leads yeah, we weren't we weren't that worried at all. I think the drafts went pretty sideways, some of them. Like uh game I think game one and two were fine. Uh although maybe in hindsight I would have first picked the Oriana in game one. Um I think in game three we had like literally zero prior anywhere, but like at that point, uh I just wanted to pick Kazi his Ezreal. Uh and like be like whatever, Kazi's insane on this champion, like just play Ezreal and we'll be fine. Um, so that we ha we always have this like late game carry, um, and then 
game four, I think draft was was really hard one for us. Uh, I think they couldn't do anything against our draft. Like their champions just suck against Wukong. Um, and then game five, uh, I think the draft was completely completely terrible. I mean, we outscaled them insanely hard in team fights, which was kind of obvious uh, because they don't have enough damage to actually like. When you engage on the Senna, she has to get eaten by the Tom Kench, and then she has to flash away afterwards because you have a Kaiser and a Rakan like bearing down on her. So she can't deal any damage. So the only damage threat they have is Rise, who gets hardcore outranged by everyone else in the team. Um, and he's he's also vulnerable to being engaged on by Rakan, right? So they have two short range carries with no mobility against like five engaged champions or four engaged plus Victor. Um, well, the real threat was that they would use that rise advantage in a side lane in order to pressure you. But then when they had Baron and they had the minion wave pushed to tier two turret and top, they decided to TP into a jungle fight, which is still one of yeah. the most mind blowing yeah, decisions. I forgot that one. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that one. That was rough. This is another that team that they should listen to that first segment where I explain that premise of just stop for a moment and think what could lose me the game at this point. So they didn't think that through, Monty. <laughs> yeah they thought yeah, nothing yeah. could lose in the game as far as i can tell yeah that yeah. was i don't know but uh I, th I think game game five draft was was pretty bad actually like uh i think we just had like no prior anywhere i mean i think the bot lane matchup is supposed to be pretty bad but you hard out scale the top lane matchup is is completely fine for nar but the, if the if the rise can roam into you like and your mini nar and rise walks up to you and presses w like you just get one shot right uh, mm -hmm. and if they have that much prior and an udir who's like the fastest clearing jungler and has the best 1v1s right now like he's just going to go and bonk your jungler uh, and it, it's gonna suck. Um, so I think, yeah, it was it was it was pretty rough that draft. Uh, like I, I think most most teams would close out against us. I, I you know this is a really unique conversation um, that we can have this week, and that's why I'm glad you agreed to come on before you had even you know won. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was I was getting really nervous. Awkward. I'll be real. I was getting really nervous in that game five. I was like, oh man. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you 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 have the balls to come on no matter what. Um, but why I wanted I was so interested in 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 having you on this week is because you have the very unique um, experience of playing the same team twice in such a short period of time. So I really wanted to understand your thoughts about Rogue coming into your first series because it's so fun to see you play them twice in a couple weeks because the the in the internal meta game evolves and it, it ended up evolving into like Oriana first pick which is very strange uh compared to other regions and and the way that other teams would have played this out so starting with your first one what were your priorities against rogue like what do you because the volibear seemed really crucial to your success um and it was a new jungler that wouldn't have been in the previous patch so how were you approaching your game plan in your first series um so leading up into those two weeks uh we had basically been looking for solutions because i think like a lot of people are saying that kazi and kaiser got gaps like super hard yesterday which to be fair there were some bad moments right but in a lot of the games we're just selling them like we're just selling our bot lane like we're like we're just going and taking herald and caitlin's there taking four plates and we're like don't worry kazi it's fine you'll be okay we got the herald um <laughs> uh so that was something that we were really really looking to counteract because we felt like if if we're if we're doing this against rogue then it's it's just gonna suck uh especially if if they manage to have mid prior and stronger jungler and you can't even force hard on top side and we're selling our bot lane then like we're just gonna like lose right um so a lot of the picks that we came into were with that being in mind, right? That we would go and attack their bot lane because we also felt that they kind of did the same, right? Like we felt like Trimby just roams all the time and they leave Hans Hammer alone bot. Uh, and sometimes they overcommitted onto top side, which happened, right? Like when we were playing like uh, the first series against Rogue, actually, we like we took their bot tower at like 10 minutes every game. Uh, and like it, like we had a Vayne game where we took their tower at like 12 minutes with Vayne. And, like, like Vayne just gets five plates because they're just like not bot when we're killing their bot tower right um so that was honestly our whole prep was was about doing that and i think we just completely took them by surprise in that series like the first three games they were just like wait why, why, why are they why are they playing around bot lane because we hadn't played around bot lane that like the entire split um <laughs> and it's something that we just drilled a lot and so all our picks were kind of geared towards that right the like, volley bear is super good at that the jinx thresh is super good at that like thresh is kind of i feel like thresh is super 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 good in lane right now um uh, or at least has been for this whole patch um and so if you're gonna like play super hard for bot lane and play really aggressive he's a pick that allows you to do that right like you can always like play the enemy support when they engage you can like step up you can let your adc step up and like then just put the lantern for him like it's it's super easy to play this champion both aggressively and uh like defensively to appeal for your adc um so those that was kind of the 
the read there. And in that series, I think Rogue just didn't adapt quickly enough. Like we had two games where the Jinx was obviously broken. Uh, and then it took them until the third game. And then we still, uh, oh no, the third game, the third game we it was we the vain game draft, I think. Oh no, yeah, yeah, we lost the first game. We lost the first game, which yeah, you uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you lost uh, you lost at the beginning of both of these best of fives, and then yeah, managed yeah, to yeah. We're, we're, sweep we're three games in, game in a row. <laughs> we're a bit cursed in game ones. Um, <laughs> the uh, yeah, 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 I remember now. Yeah, the it it was it was until game four that they actually like adapted properly, um, but then then it was another it was another late game comeback in that game, right? Yeah, yeah, we had the mm-hmm. we had the the TF Kaiser comp again. Yep. So, uh, based on what you learned, how did you approach the second series against Rogue? Because this is where I think you can really see the effect of having played each other so many games in a couple weeks span. Like, what what changed into Game Three where you're like, all of a sudden, Oriana is first pick blue side. Uh I think Oriana was always first pick blue side for us. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it is basically one... like humanoids fucking main champion. <laughs> like to be fair, so it makes sense. I think game one was just kind of a troll draft for me because, uh, like, we. I mean, it's weird because I've I've never been in a situation where you're scrimming your opponents in the same week, uh, which is what you you do in this situation, right? There are two teams beneath you in the lower bracket, and you scrim two days with G two and two days with Rogue, uh, and it was super weird. Um, we were sure that G2 were going to win. So we tested a lot of picks against Rogue. So they saw all of our picks, <laughs> which is why there was a Seraphine ban every game, because we played a bunch of Seraphine against them. Uh, and it's why there was a Nami Uh-oh. ban in second rotation, Uh-oh. because we played- I was we... wondering about that. <laughs> because we played a Nami into them in one scrim, and it looked really good. Um, so that's why that was there. Um, so it was really weird coming into the series, like, huh. Like we kind of saw all of their cheeses that they were prepping for G2, and they kind of saw all of ours, I think. Um, so, it well, was, by the it way, really uh, the fresh. reason the reason why I didn't realize that you guys were willing to first pick Oriana and Blue Side is that you literally didn't play Blue Side in your first series, and you just picked yeah. it on Red Side first. <laughs> That's why I was like, really? And then I was like, oh, I just wouldn't know that because it didn't yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah. the, the second series, we we really wanted the Uda. Uh, because it's just the fastest farming jungler right now. And we felt like the series was going to be, like what we said before, right, about Inspired invading blue buffs all the time. And in game one, we felt like if if we get, uh, like, Udyr and they get Orianna and we get Victor, like, Victor can have the lane prior early on if he wants. At least, I think, Marek on Victor can have the lane prior early on if he wants. Um, I think he does more on that champion laning phase than other people. Uh, and then, then you have Udyr versus, I think we had Udyr versus Hecarim, right? Yeah. And, and the, the Hecarim ends up being like two levels down and we throw the lead because we don't take the Infernal Drake and, our, and we sell our bot lane when we take Herald and I think we don't use our Herald properly. Like there's a bunch of bad stuff that we do to snowball the game, but like we're, we're really snowballing through jungle in that game. And I think if we execute it correctly, the game just ends in, I don't know, 25 minutes because we're going to hit our spikes and then just force on them with like massively bigger front line than them. Do you have any kind of um, analysis on, like, is there something about the patch that the fucking playoffs was played on or what? Because the junglers who were the monsters in the spring, it's the same thing I said on the LCS segment or Blabber. It's like, mate, like for me personally, I would probably, if I had a vote, have given Inspired like the MVP. Like I thought he was actually yep. maybe the best player in the whole league. So again, it. mate, if, I'm the, if I've got the MVP on my team, like you better show up in the finals. Like some of these performances were like, some of these were a bit ropey, mate. Was there something about the meta you think made Jungler's not able to be as impressive? Like, did he just in this series play bizarrely? What would you say to that performance? Uh, I mean, Jungle is really dependent on mid lane. And I think that uh, Larson's lane didn't go that well in most of the games against Marek. I think Marek was playing insanely well in lane in like every yep. single game. Uh, and when when that's happening to you as a jungler, you don't really have that many options. That being said, they had a lot of prior on on bot in in some games, so he could probably have done more. Like I don't think that Inspired had a great series by any means, but I think I don't know. Like they had a Bo5 the day before, right? So there's always going to be a True. big portion there, uh, which like it's hard to be as fast and as decisive and as proactive in those situations. So I think situations where Inspired would, might normally have like had a like generated a really big jungle lead perhaps he wasn't able to i would have to go back and look at the games and watch him yeah just wanted like you know uh, broad strokes yeah, yeah sure but in, in terms of meta i don't think there's anything like i think actually in terms of getting the the champions that he 
normally players to be able to like 1v9 games right there during the Lilia, like they were available. Yeah. To be fair, they opted into the Hecarim, which is not very good at doing that, right? Like Hecarim, like it, what Inspired has been really insane at this split is doing what we talked about before, right? Inviting, uh, yep. invading every Raptor camp, every blue buff, getting the Herald, right? On Hecarim, you just chain gank. Like it's just a, a champ where you just farm and gank. And if you get your, your ganks off, then you're winning because you're Hecarim in the late game. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, he, they opted into the Hecarim a lot. Clearly, like they obviously thought this champ was like super OP. Uh, like G2 Rogue were both banning it blue every single game, if I remember correctly. Um, and in scrims, they banned it every single game on blue against us as well. But we just like don't care about Hecarim actually, um, or at least we didn't in this in this series. Maybe that will change. Uh, but we didn't care care about Hecarim at all because we felt like stronger jungle matchup would just would just win the matchup. So that's also probably a big factor that you don't invade on. Should we talk a bit about G2 Monty? I mean, I think it's a pretty fun <laughs> conversation because here's one reason why we are literally not, not only did they play, but we are mandated to talk about them. And here's why, Monty, because every single G2 player was voted the best player in their position. So that's, that's right. If you're a reckless, and reckless fan, was MVP of the league. If, if you're a reckless fan, everyone agrees. The consensus is he had all the best players in the fucking league on his team, guys. This is mental. Because here's the thing people don't understand. I'm, I'm going to put it in context right from the get-go. Reckless didn't throw the series. He wasn't like the worst player ever. By the way, spoiler, that's literally from day one, my problem with Reckless. He plays so he can never be the fucking worst player. And guess what? If you play so you can never be the worst player, you're very rarely going to be the best player who carries the whole series. So my problem with Reckless is this, right? If he basically plays ADC the way tradition... Like if I was going to make a bot play ADC in a, in like a virtual simulation of League, he'd play the way Reckless does. Like, you play conservative when you need to, when you have the resources to carry and you're teammate peel fit then you carry the team fight right the problem is this the players i i think are the gods of the adc position and no matter what people say every time reckless is up there he gets contrasted with the deaths the uzi eyes those players right in my opinion that's like an inappropriate contrast like to me i said it on twitter the only asian player i think you should ever contrast reckless with is prey because the best prey teams are the ones where he ain't the main focus and then he does a god tier job as like a tertiary or secondary carry and just always he's always responsible with his lane and then he does all the shit you need in the team fight but that's not like uzi i deft forgiven these are players who try to break the game from ad carry i wouldn't make the bot play the way those players play because it's actually inappropriate for the role but the point is the bot is playing as though everyone's playing the game correctly sometimes you don't have the teammate in the other position who could carry in that kit so you have to be like uzi i and say i'm gonna hard carry this game no matter what sometimes in a team fight you don't have the peel but you have to say you know what i'm gonna risk dying to kill that specific player and then hope the rest of my team carry off the fight that's my problem basically with recklessness right I agree. Yeah, I don't mind him having the MVP, by the way. I think if, if for regular season only, I think it's totally valid that people thought he was the MVP. He was certainly probably the best player on G2, I think, which says a lot, by the way, if you play with Caps. The problem I have is, though, like the, the way these series go, I can see why no one criticised him because he didn't look like the worst player. But it's like, brother, come on, man. Like, Hans Sammer's not a legend. No one's going to put him against Uzi I in the future. He's just a very good player. This is These are the series where if you're the, the, the greatest, you just go off, mate. And like I said... You can't make a single excuse about teammates. Some of them didn't play well in this series. But you, again, mate, if you're going to make mis complain about those teammates, you're worse than Forgiven. Forgiven used to complain about Jan Kors and fucking Oduam. Like, you've got better players than that, arguably. I, I think for me, it's, it's you know, that factor is like when you bring in Reckless, right, to replace Perks, you're expecting that you're getting a player who is at an individual level a superior player to yeah. the AD carry because Perks, at the end of the day, and is was probably. <laughs> and, yeah. and was so yeah. we were never talking like perks was not in the conversation for like who is the best mechanical ad carry right that was never really his jam uh when he switched to that role at g2 but what i think is interesting here is that you're hoping that the upside of having a long time you know famous ad carry championship ad carry like reckless is going to make up for the what you lose when it comes to shot calling and i think what we saw in the end was that G2 does not look like the same team that can improvise as well in the late game that understands how to play the side lanes in order to kind of get themselves back into a game or uh, create very unique plays. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really huge issue. And on the, the other side, we saw C9 doing some very interesting things to get them back into the games that they were losing and probably should have lost, you know, making the aggressive calls. 
And for me, it just looks like the direction of G2 in game, like the, the magic wasn't there this time around. It's interesting what you mentioned, Thorin, about uh, Prey being a weak side player, though, right? Like, that was what they did, right? They put, like, like Gorilla Prey were, like, soaking all the Every pressure. Every team there, he like, was on would the always side. have the top lane carry. He was yeah, all yeah. the great Korean top lane carries, yeah. yeah. So it, it really, and I think that that's a model that you could very easily apply to, to G2 this year, except they, they didn't, right? Like, and it wasn't until playoffs that they switched to start playing top lane carries, but they didn't look that practiced on it. And I felt like their drafts around it were not, as good as they used to be like drafting against g2 used to be like absolutely terrifying right because they'd be flexing, like five different yes. champions that you'd never seen before between mid and top and uh, you don't even know who they actually want to carry that game like they don't come yeah. in with a set plan did they in the old lineup because anyone could just get it at the end yeah because i mean they like that's the exact identity they had in uh 20 was it 2019 or 2018 with Hyanna 2018 Nimbus, was right? the one where they just had the top side Hyanna, of the map and it was Hyanna Hyanna and then, did, yeah. yeah Hyanna did right which was the like weak side bot lane soak pressure and then like play through your your solo lanes right and i was really surprised that they didn't take on that type of model earlier seemed on obvious the, right split. yeah because they they just played with like what would you want to tie on every game i don't know yeah uh, so that was that was really surprising to me because then you end up with these compositions where you have uh seraphine bot Sai on top uh like some dog jungler and then uh, Lucian and like you have one carry in your entire comp like and like if, if you get mid prior where does it go like what are you doing with the mid prior I guess you go and get wards on the enemy on the enemy jungle and then you like push mid some more and you try and abuse the guy 1v1 right and that's a lot of the games they had where they were like popping off was where like for example the rogue game in second round robin in regular season right where they just kill Larson like six times because everyone's just going mid like next to the I think it was, oh, it was the Azir into Lucian matchup I think if I remember correctly yeah like they're, they're doing that with Lucian right um but when they weren't able to do that, it was it was really weird uh, because, yeah, I, I felt like they didn't have anywhere for the pressure to go with caps. Right. Um, so I was honestly, I think it might not even be so much of a question of like team balance, but I feel like their, their read on the meta or their understanding of how to get the compositions that favored them was was really flawed during playoffs. Like the like even their series against Rogue, I didn't feel like Rogue was like massively better than G2. I just felt like. The, some of the drafts just didn't work. Like if you look at the like the the game that like knocked G two out of playoffs, that draft was like I look I looked at it and I was like, oh man, like this sucks. Like you, you saw in the in the late game, like they just can't do anything. Right? They can't split push, they can't engage, they can't team fight. Like they just lose every single like aspect of the game. Um, and that to me just looks like the like they didn't have the correct read on the meta, or they didn't understand how to execute their read on the meta inside the draft. Right. Um, so, and and for reference, yeah. that was the game in which they drafted their their comp was Karma, Udir, Silas, Silas Ash, yeah. Brom, which basically means that they're all I mean, their only real form of engage is an Ash arrow. So I mean, it's I think it's hard for them to even get close to Rogue's composition. Like how do you yeah, and they they have triple magic damage top side into a Renekton and Renekton is good into like all of their champions apart from Ash Brom, like their their whole top side, like Renekton's actively good into them. Um, I like, I think in that game, he just got Merc Treads and then built HP and was just like laughing in their faces, you know, like it, it didn't matter if he mispositioned, it didn't matter if they got the perfect engage onto him. It didn't matter if they like ran him down the lane for 10 minutes, like it didn't matter. He's like, he's immortal in that game. Um, by the way, this actually, obviously we can get off the record. I just wanted to get that off my chest, but here's the other part. Like the next player I want to talk about, because basically if people don't know, my biggest problem with Reckless is simple. It's, it's not that he can't, by the way, be the best player on the team. It's just that when he is the best player on the team, they don't tend to win. I think the only split from memory where he might have been the best player on his team or they played through him was maybe, I think like, I think season eight, the second year they had caps, like they, in the spring, they maybe played through Reckless a lot and they did win that split, obviously. But aside from that, every time he wins the, the put it this way, guys. There's a reason why Reckless has twice received an MVP when he was already out of the tournament or couldn't win the championship. Like, that's not a great look. Whereas the problem is, this here's the, here's the issue here, Monty, right? Anyone who hears me contrast Reckless with Prey and starts going, wow, he's hitting on Reckless. Y'all are th so stupid, it's unbelievable. If you think to be compared to Prey is a diss, you just actually don't value like greatness in League of Legends. What I'm talking about is like what Mac nailed there, it's team balance and who, you, who you're playing through, how they play, who enables who, what do you need at what point in the game to be the right player. Like The point is like you don't necessarily want Prey to be your best player. You're probably not going to be the LCK champion. You're not going to win Worlds. Like, But you tell you what, if you have an amazing top lane and a good mid lane and you have Prey as your any kite, it's a lot. 
Rock. That was Reckless's career, boys. Every time his team wins the championship, his solos are legit as fuck, and he is the perfect complement to them. I don't know why people have a problem with someone just being a fucking Robin. Just be the best Robin. There's no, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Oh, by the way, go the other route. Like, I've always said this. My favourite Reckless split was, I think it was season six summer or something off the top of my head, the one where he actually did try to play, like, the hard carry where he had all those shit teammates. Well, the problem is he didn't win the championship, but I'll tell you what, it was fun to do. So as... as Believe it or not, after all this time, for Reckless fans, you have to make the choice. Would you like your player to be the best? If so, they might not win the championship. Problem is, you've built your whole identity that he's the best player because he wins the championship. So you're the ones who have to resolve that. I don't. I'm fine with it. It's like you can either go out on your shield like a samurai and not win, but maybe be the best player. Or you can just say, I want to be on one of the best teams, as he did in the offseason, and go and join the team that could potentially do that for you. Because just flip it over, the player I feel like we have to really look at in this series for G2 is Wonder, surely. Like, this is where what I've been saying for the last two years finally kicks in. Now is the moment we can start asking, like, Maybe he shouldn't play World of Warcraft half the time. Maybe that shouldn't be a funny thing that he one times all the champions in the fucking LEC. That's sick and really baller if you're absolutely so far ahead and your team is unbeatable that that just becomes like a luxury. In fact, it even becomes almost intimidating that you know he doesn't even play that much and he might be first time. That's, that's a crazy thing to add. Tell you what, when you're in the kind of form Wonder was actually for most of this split and then you arrive at playoffs and you have to just pick Sion all the time, like... I don't care that he did the joke. Like, I might have to uninstall WoW now. Now it's not funny anymore, Wonder. Because I said this coming into the split. I didn't expect Reckless to be the MVP because I thought, like, Mac, it's obvious how this team plays out. Surely even Reckless joining knows. The whole point of this split is in an ideal world, it's just Caps versus Wonder battling each other for the MVP as they just shit on every solo lane. But unfortunately, it was very far from that. And this was the split where, like... I think Wonder in the past was an amazing top. I think this split, yeah, he might have cost G2 a whole bunch of fucking like, leads, potential chance to dominate, though. Like, maybe. What, what, do you, what do you guys think on this one? Because I was massively underwhelmed by this. I mean, just, just to finish off on Reckless quickly, I think, like, yeah, as, go a, on. as a Robin, like, to be clear, he is the best Robin, right? Oh, like, probably the best there, in there Europe ever, yeah. No, there is no one that is yes. as good at not dying and farming CS. As reckless, right? Like he is insane. Absolutely. Like as as a it's, piece the, same, roster, it's, it's the same. Like it's the same shit as prey. It's the same shit as prey. Yeah, prey exactly. was very good at not dying, while gorilla went off and roamed all over the map and still getting the CS that he needed in order to be a secondary carry in the mid game. Agreed. Yeah, but then that obviously doesn't work if you aren't playing super hard through your top side, right? Um, to be fair, during the regular season, I like I every time I look at Wunder play the. Like the way he moves the map in the mid game, I still feel like he's just a cut above almost everyone else. Like I feel, I feel like he's one of the. So he knows how to win the game, yeah. In the mid late game, yes. Um, I don't know why they weren't drafting carries for him. I don't know why like his form went so wacky in playoffs, right? Like in our first series, well, in our only series against G two, like we we played like what four NAR games, and he tried like a different champion into NAR every time, and none of them worked, which is weird right like normally that's not something you expect to happen like if, if i'm in a bo5 and i've won three ga like two games with nar and like nar looked really good in the in the third one and then in the fourth game i don't see a nar ban i'm feeling real good about the series uh and that's something that really surprised me about like again like in the past like g2 were always really good at like flipping the table and adapting mid-series and just being like okay like this champion's gone and now i'm going to counter pick you with this like totally random thing that you've never mm -hmm. seen before uh, and like all of the stuff that they were counter picking us with with the NAR was stuff that we were like, okay, like okay, you're gonna pick Silas, fine. Like that lane matchup is really terrible. Okay, you're gonna pick Akali, fine. We don't think Akali's a good champion. If we did, then Humanoid would be first picking it because he's the best Akali. Uh, so like whatever, right? And we like the only one that like uh, that we thought was a good counter pick was the Jace, but even then we didn't care because by then like we had three insane NAR games. So like sure, pick your Jace. I don't care. Like Armut's feeling it today. He's going to be, play a good NAR game and he can play the matchup. Uh, and then the Jace game didn't work out because of the like horrendous crab fight on uh, top side at five minutes, right? Um, but yeah, I didn't feel like. And coming, like the series against us, they did exactly what we expected them to do, right? Which was that they are going to counter pick top side. They're going to prepare a bunch of different like counter picks to NAR and play like their Irelia or Akali or Silas or whatever it is into NAR or Jace. Uh, but like. I don't know why it didn't work out. I like he definitely had a like rough series against against Armut. I think Armut was insane in that series against him. Um, although I think the Akali game he played well. Is is this? I mean, I think 
I, I, you know, I, I said what I thought earlier about just the whole team kind of seeming off. And I think that whereas in the past, the way that you described them flipping the tables in draft, um, it, it definitely didn't feel as effective with the champion picks that you're, that you're quoting here. So it feels like some of the decision-making is not quite as keen as it used to be, but it's also the way sometimes that they apply pressure in the side lanes just doesn't, they don't seem to, when I watch them, it doesn't seem to have the same kind of like smothering pressure that they used to have in the mid and late game. And for me, that's a lot of what probably perks was bringing to the table is a, these decisive calls or like abilities to the ability to create calls that make comebacks possible. And for me, that is kind of what's missing from G2 now, too, is that I don't have the same faith that they are going to engineer a, a come from behind victory that I did when Perks was on the roster. And I think that if you are going to lean into some of these wacky picks, you have to know how to use them creatively in order to make them effective. And that wasn't there for me in a lot of these games. And even though they did win the Akali game, right? They did win that one. Yeah, that was the yeah. one game they won. Yeah. 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 There's one, one game they won. It It didn't feel to me that the Akali had really anything to do with the victory at all. Uh, we didn't think so either. We didn't think so either. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, he played the lane well is what I was referring to in that, in okay. that game. Like, I think he was winning the lane against, against Armour. Yeah. Game. That was more in the context of like the NAR matchups. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it's, it's weird actually, because I mean, what you're saying about the side laning, I kind of agree with because it felt like when G2 was behind, they were way less decisive about what they were doing. And yeah. it's funny because like there, there were three people that I learned side laning from, like when I joined LEC, like three years ago, I think. Yeah. Three years ago, like was, uh, Perks, Wunder, and then Doinby were like the three people that I watched to learn how to move the map in the mid game. And that's like, that, that was like the, like opening my eyes moment of like, oh, wow, this is how the mid game works because they were so insanely smart about how they move the map in the mid game. Uh, about when they went to side lane, when they grouped through mid, when they got vision, when they transferred from one side into the other, like all of these things, they did insanely well. And I still think that Wunder does that really well. Like when, like for example, that's one of the reasons why I think they're so successful on Sion because Sion is insane at doing that. Like he's really good at understanding when he can cheat a wave on the weak side and get away with it and use his ulti to escape or when he should group through mid and force with his ulti or whatever it is, right? Um, but it felt like, I definitely agree that it felt less creative from behind. Uh, I think something that, I think something that Grabs has been quite outspoken on before is that he feels like the uh, the Dragon Soul stymies that creativ creativity a lot because you can't yes. cross yep. up objectives in the same way that you yeah. used yes. to be able to. And actually, if you look back at G2's international record, like in Europe, it's never showed up that much because they were just better than everyone else. But they've never been in like an insane, 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 insane early game team where they're just going to like uh, like full court press you into death right and like stack every drake and like take all the objectives and and like 1v9 you in in lane and just like crush you from minute one they've always been this team where they're just insanely creative at coming back into the game but in they an take, where you're forced they to take team fight. incremental advantages in the mid and late game and what made them so amazing is that they did it in a way that no one else would think to do so it was it was very difficult to play against them because they would they would on the fly figure out what the advantage was that they had and then punish you for it. And there was no real way to prep against it because you couldn't prep against their, their weird picks or you couldn't prep against this like wacky engage that they would take that no one else would do. That's how I felt yeah. about it. And it's it was why I actually yeah. literally, it's why I actually do think, and I'm actually in some ways glad this team lost. Although I actually think, by the way, if I had these five players, I just re-roll and go for summer and maybe we fucking win and it doesn't matter anyway. Like the players are so good, you can figure this out. But with that said, in a way, I'm glad this team didn't win LAC because it'll actually make people for a moment actually acknowledge how incredible that fucking run from yeah. the other team was when they had it, especially particularly when they used perks at ADC. Obviously, like, what a crazy dynamic. Because to me, that team is the only Western team ever. As long, assuming we're not going really back to the dinosaur edge of like Moscow 5, who I always said this, even before they beat them, they were the only Western team that had a factor that could actually make an elite Asian team in potentially intimidated. And it was exactly this. It's that even though, in theory, we might be the best team in the world on paper, this is the one team that is never out of the game. This is the one team that can find a way that we aren't even thinking of back into the game. This lineup can't do that. Like, they can like manipulate the waves properly and they can create a situation where like you know they get the bright pick and they can basically do what a normal team would do as the best players but they lost that like magical quality for sure because that was the thing it was the two combined in my opinion it wasn't just that like it was the super team with that lineup in my opinion the most crazy thing was even if i had the players to match them my players can't 
engineer these ridiculous comebacks. My players can't flex everything all over the draft. So, like, it's the uncertainty factor that I think feel like always kept an opponent, like, off kilter. Whereas if you have a lead against this team, you've just got a lead against some very good players. Yeah, you can close out the game. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not some, like, fucking Rubik's Cube you have to solve within 30 seconds or something. Like, it's doable. So, to me, like, some of their aura was pierced as soon as, as Perks left and you just saw what they are actually like as a team. Because now they're just, like, a super team of, you know, just on paper the best players in the, t in the LEC. But... That that just won't win you the league outright, you know. That's not that's not always the best. The best roster doesn't always win. Yeah, I mean, I think G two has always been the reason why they've been so undefeatable is that like I, I've been in plenty of regular season and playoff games where we've had a significant lead against G two at fifteen, but they were always just so good at playing from behind because they were so creative about pushing out side lanes, cross mapping you really decisively, and always making you like make your decisions fast, right? Like if you hesitated for 30 seconds on a decision, that's an extra wave they got on top side, which means there's an extra wave they get like resetting and coming through bot side and like transferring the pressure and like finding a creative flank somewhere or something like that, right? So if you if you were like slightly slow on your decision around an objective, they would cross map you faster and they would gain more on the on the backswing on the next play, right? Um, in, a, in a world where if you're significantly behind at 15, enemies have two dragons and you know you only have, you now have 10 minutes to cross map them. Uh, but you're significantly behind and the enemy ADC is going to hit three item power spike before your ADC is going to hit the, their three item power spike and you cannot cross map the fourth dragon or you lose the game. Uh, that style doesn't work, mm -hmm. um, which I think has been the the biggest thing for, for G2 because that's that's what to me made them so like unbeatable in the past was that they were so insanely good at cross mapping you. But stacking drakes is just like too good about that i think i remember grab saying on an interview that he wishes the first drake just couldn't be soloed by junglers like if you made the first dragon like if you averaged like i don't know plus three plus four minutes to when the first dragon can be legitimately soloed by a jungler just like by base stats then maybe you can actually cross map into the game with your camille or whatever it is who now has three items instead of 2.5 versus the enemy adc's three items well um, i think what's what's interesting about this too is that riot with the the kind of proposed at least jungler buffs that are kind of on PBE right now, it seems like they want to make even more junglers have a viable option of doing that. Like the meta shifted into these full clear, uh, very low assistance required junglers overall that were, were really about the clearing speed and your ability to do it with relatively high HP, right? And still get into the mix on things. And it just seems like the game, Riot is pushing the game in that direction to unlock even more champions that you can do that with, right? Which is only going to exacerbate that issue. Yeah. Well, it unlocks team fighting, right? Which is what which is what Riot probably wants from a spectator point of view. But yeah, like until like so jungle was changed to remove catch up XP, right? And if there is no catch up XP in the game, then this is always the jungle meta. Always. It doesn't matter because like there is just too much standing gold on the map in the jungle camps to like and too much XP, which is the most crucial thing in the early game, right? Like early game XP leads, like one level is worth so much gold between like level three and level two. It doesn't matter if the enemy guy has an extra long sword in his back. It doesn't matter at all. Like if you level up on him, you just you just destroy him 1v1, right? Um, so anytime that there is a jungle meta in terms of like the way that the jungle is balanced on a like much more broader abstract level where there's no catch up XP, this is always the meta. Like you can only play fast clearing junglers because if you like, if you do like, you know, Back in back when there was catch up XP, people used to do like red buff on red side into bot lane gank. You know, if you do that now, you are three levels down in four minutes again. Even if you get the gank off, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you get the kill, you're, you're yes. three levels down. Like and, it's not solo queue boys. Get, yeah, and that means that the guy gets the first dragon, and then he gets yeah. the first herald, and then with that first herald, he's going to get at least three hundred gold worth of plates, which already negates the value of the first like the first blood that you've got. And then he's going to take all of your blue buffs, and then you're not going to have mid lane prior, and then he's going to take the second dragon at ten minutes, and then like the game is over. Um, so that's just the way that jungle is right now. One of the things about that that I think is very interesting as well is I'll say this, even though obviously it's mildly awkward since you're actually in the call for this particular discussion. It's probably a better one if Grabs was here, right? If we look at the timing, I know most of the players in Rogue and Mad Lions obviously weren't in the LEC two years ago, but like you look at the seasons when EU had, in theory, its best ever teams, season eight, Fnatic, season nine, G2, right? This is the period in time where the game is wide open, which always has suited Europe because Europe loves the side laners with all those elite fucking solo laners. So in this period, 
you had these teams that suddenly could challenge the best Asian teams. And in fact, as everyone knows, the really dominant narrative was it sort of fucked the Koreans because since the game wasn't sort of like a, a flow chart of do this followed by these options, like they found themselves lost in a lot of mid games. Like famously that SKT versus G2 series, I think from Worlds. Like I look back at that and I'm like, dude, there's no Korean team loses from the positions they were in like three years before that. Like, but that was the, the perfect time, perfect meta and the perfect sort of a meta context of how different regions thought about the game. Problem is you come to the era when it's all about dragon stacking. All of a sudden you have these new teams, Rogue Mad Lines rising up and challenging the absolute best players. Like some of that has got to be Mac because it had, it did some, to some degree streamline what you do in macro and League of Legends, right? So as a result, the value of having someone like Perks, these players who talk about Wonder, it's not that their value goes down. It's that it's sort of like it boosts the other guy to just closer automatically, even if he's a rookie, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. It's funny. I was thinking about the, the G2 SK, SKT series. Was that the series where they didn't take a single Baron and still won the series? Uh, dragons. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't well, so uh, it the one where they gave up every dragon, basically? There was a series where they, where they, they I think they won 3-1 or 3-0 without yeah. taking a single Baron. Um, Might have been Baron then, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I recall that. Like and that that's exactly the thing, right? They had and it was the same against Gen G last year at Worlds. Um, like the and they, they, they still managed to pull it off against against Gen G and SKT somehow, was that like they were just way, 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 way faster at cross mapping through side lanes. Yes. Uh, and the Korean teams didn't know how to respond to it. Uh and but hilariously so that, as well you could even were... look on their faces like what the fuck is going on because obviously the other korean team played against them <laughs> yeah. I, we always made this point on this show by the way that it's it's sad in a way that koreans were like absurdly dominant because it made fans think they had no weaknesses to how they think about the game the weakness for the korean teams it's why actually the idea that monty ever said all the games in lck were the best one of the worst things about lck forever would be when the number one team played the number two team gets a slight lead and number two just like has a gentleman's agreement to be slightly behind for the whole game <laughs> and then just just losing well, the most that's, underwhelming that's, fashion. That's some shit where it's like, give it a fucking increase the variance. And they're like, variance? No, of course not. My coach said, to, like, they just they always just play out correctly, lose the game. Yeah, like, well, that's like it's like honorable or something. You know? That that's because <laughs> the meta was in in an unlimited vision meta, which League of Legends yes. used to be. The Koreans did not want to. They refused to make plays without a hundred percent information. Right. Because that the way they were, the way all the teams operated was acquire as much information about the state of the game as possible and make decisions off of that. So when Riot limited vision and by necessity, every player now has to make decisions based off of odds and not complete information, they were just paralyzed. Right. They would not make they would not make a 90 percent play. They would wait for a 100 percent play that never existed. Right. Or never would, yeah. would exist. Especially I mean, as you get into the late game now, different. especially as you get in the late game now, because now there's even bigger vision problems in the late game. You get to six items and you can't even buy control wards. It's just like everybody swapped a blue trinket now and hope we <laughs> get some vision, right? Hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like the, the removal of, of Sightstone was literally the worst thing ever for Korean teams. Like yes, it was so horrible. awful for them because they were insane at vision. They were yes. so good at vision. Um, like they, it was just their thing, you know, they were just 10 times better than all of the Western teams at Vision. And then it went and then suddenly you're testing for a completely different skill set, right? You're not testing for the ability to plan ahead and choke your opponent out. You're testing for the ability to make decisions with less information. Uh, and they were not very good at that. as you. And G2 right? and is one of the best awful. teams ever one of the best at that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And this is this is why this is why we always were, were pumping them up, because th this ability and their ability to improvise like a jazz virtuoso was just magnificent, but it wasn't. And Thorne, I know you love to say this, but it wasn't because LEC was good. It was because G2 was an outlier in LEC for being able to do this. And not only in LEC, they were an outlier in the world for being oh, able man, to do I used this. to, I used to literally, because obviously everyone knows, like, one of my main fucking battles till the end of time, which I'll never be able to win because of the very inherent nature of it, is the concept of a global meta in League of Legends, as in this is just how everyone, who no matter who they are in the world of any skill level, uh, some pro player, should play this champion in these comps. I'll never understand that thinking, because to me, it's the opposite of coaching. It's actually just copying. Like, coaching is you tailor things to the players you have, and then a mixture of overlapping some things that are strong. Put it this way, if you do a global meta, you never do those fucking Wukong top lane picks. That's not the right pick there. 
But I tell you what, maybe it is if you've got Armour and that's a specific matchup, that might be the perfect pick. So there's a great example, right? So one of the reasons I hate that thinking overall is because basically you went, oh, where, where did I start there, Monty? I lost myself on that. What was the what was the point I was taking from you? Your, your point that it wasn't G2, like LEC that was good. It was G2. That was that it, was yeah. So basically, one of the things that really used to tilt me about G2 being the best was then people would act as though like, why don't the other teams do this? Or why don't you learn your lessons? <laughs> like, There's nothing to learn. That's like if you go and you fight against some like, like for, the best example would be like currently, like, if anyone follows the UFC, right? That would be like watching what Khabib does, right? And going, why doesn't everyone just ground and pound and grind the guy? Like, because it's easier said than done, mate. No one else has the skill set he has to, to that level. So as a result, you can't do what he does. And if, even worse, you're trying. Not only can you not do what he does, but everyone else is struggling to find a counter. So there, there are there were no easy answers to that G two team. People were way too dismissive. Like if you actually look back now. Now that everything's got been and done and there's nothing left to be played from that last lineup, you look back now, if anything, you look at teams like that mad fanatic lineup that still had Brox and when he was all washed. It's mental they were even going in five games against these teams. Like, that's actually impressive as fuck. It's mental that last year people were even winning series off the guys, even if they were online. Like to even beat that team is like unbelievable in my opinion. So like that is that is true, like one of the outlier teams in history, not just for the results, but like the style that they played. And no one will ever probably replicate that. Right. Probably and also because let's be real, what are the odds that you're gonna have? Not only someone who played mid lane then swapped to ADC he doesn't even have to be the best still carries shot caller qualities and chooses to sometimes not even play the best meta ADC like that everything about it was so alien it'll never happen again maybe the closest on a weird angle if people know this and well I'll probably reference this again in a few weeks when I have someone on is maybe what like Zhao Hu's doing in RNG as a top laner that's maybe like slightly and that's just positional really it's not like he's fucking perks is it so like I, don't, I think people will probably appreciate this G2 team until years after. It's the same with all the great teams, you know. And and the, the only comparison that we could make from the European region is to the old Moscow 5 roster uh, that some because they were such great players of their own style, they were the ones who were beating Korean teams at like IEMs and stuff like that. Um, they were famously the, the only team to like beat Korean teams for years. And even though it was in an earlier state of League of Legends, they had a similar kind of aura uh, that G2 had, but it took years to get G2 after Moscow 5 died, right? But I think people also forget that, uh, like what you were saying about replicating the G2 style, right? Like people tried. Like, do you remember the Origin lineup that went to second place in Spring Split yes. in 2019? Like they were really good playing standard and then they went to finals and they got destroyed by all of yes. these like weird aspects and they came back in summer and were like, we're going to play Talia bot lane and we're going to play Karma and we're going to play Zoe. And like, it just didn't work, right? They and just, missed they playoffs, the exactly, the exactly. And the playoffs. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm sure there were other issues going on. Oh, of course, team, yeah, right? yeah. Because they were still like, yeah, they were yeah. still not bad on that style. Stylistically, that makes sense. But but they were not G2, right? When they when they tried to copy G2 style, like they were a much better team playing standard. They were a really good team playing standard and trying to copy G2 kind of like ruined them. Like they, Put tried it to way, it, mate. Like, they just got destroyed I think, in some I think he might even have said this much in my interview with him, but I'm pretty sure those were because I remember especially that spring one that you were talking about. Like, dude, Origin was the team that on paper should have been able to potentially beat G2. Like they had such Mithy was doing such a smart job in terms of how he led the team. They looked like actually everyone had good communication called as well. All the laners in theory were good at the time. Time. they had some of the best laners like they had the team on paper they had the versatility they had the understanding of how to set up early and mid game the problem was every time they got like as this conversation goes into a nice uh, even a slight advantage in the mid game or early it's like and then the game plays out in a way no one could ever predict or ever have practiced for and g2 wins the game like i'm pretty sure that was the year where mythy was like i think i'll just retire now this is a fucking waste of my time like what <laughs> what am i even doing here like we're in well, i mean all the positions i've got the players i'm in the position to win and we lose anyway like i'd, I'd be demoralized in that scenario too I mean, Origin, Origin was like, like really unlucky that year, I think, because in, in a different region, like they would have been a champion or a different year, they would yes, have been a champion, agreed. right? Like, like that yeah. team is like actually a really interesting parallel to a team like SKT in terms of their play style and that they were so good at like vision and taking yeah. like small advantages, fundamentals, rotational, like 15 second advantage on one rotation from one side to the other, to the other, to the other, agreed. to the other, to the other, until, until you've taken a tower for free. And the other, and the other guy's just there like, Hey, where the fuck did my tower go? Like, because you've just out rotated them for like 10 minutes and you have perfect vision. You know, they were insane at that type of game, but like, they just got unlucky. Like they were in the same league as G2 when, when like the, all of those champions were possible.
You know, this is this is actually making me somewhat if we're going back to like 20, 2019, it does make me nostalgic in a in a bad way uh, for the G2 FPX finals that were the world's finals of that year, because given G2 style and given FPX style, I feel like it's such a bummer that G2 didn't show up to that series because that in theory in that year could have been one of the weirdest, most fucking great best of fives of all time if if both teams had shown up on that day um and for you know whatever reason g2 just didn't look like they were in it at all like they just didn't they said they seemed like a completely different team in that final but i really wish we had seen a proper clash of those styles because i think it would have been absolutely wonderful yeah, I mean, if they had got to mid game and got to actually do their their like mid game yeah. specialty, like the the fights that you would have seen in mid game in that series would have been like unreal. Yeah. The problem with that series is, listen, I'm not like a homer for regions and that. Like, I just do that for fun on Twitter. I don't really give a fuck. Like, some of my favorite teams were the LPL teams, for example. But that particular series, like, I can't even properly, like, let myself remember it because the second, like, I I actually love playing the champion pipe, but the second I see that champion in my brain, I get, like, PTSD from that series. Like, <laughs> that was, because if, if we're tying it in, it's a perfect connection. Obviously, the pike that they played against Origin in Season 9 Spring, finals incredible that was fucking beautiful but the pike that was played in the world's finals that was a fucking abomination that was not <laughs> enjoyable because i listen as a pike player i know what it's like to play it and just never get a chance to actually come online it's like well i just wasted this whole game and i didn't do anything for my team cool <laughs> why am i picking this champion actually <laughs> it's okay i traded all of this big bag of nothing for like 50 exactly. cs on my poor yeah. adc <laughs> you literally get nothing out of it exactly there's no there's no upside if you can't come online is it? it's just shit it's just shit and wasn't that the game wasn't it caps wasn't it like the mid laner as well it's like brother it can't be our best player as well it can't <laughs> we can't be having our best player on the champion that doesn't come online because think about it, right if you, there's another thing right this is what's a bit depressing if you ask someone like carlos etc because we are sort of saying bad news mate like you probably never get a team like that again because no one will like not only do you have the best team but you have like a transcendent talent in caps who also was just beating all the best mid laners and like actually might even have been the best player in the world i wouldn't have hated that if someone had said that at one point in time like if you have those sorts of players in those teams, you don't. There's not a big window on that. You've just got to win. You can't. You can't. Have, you don't get four chances to win the world finals. That you know. You've got to take them when you get them. Unfortunately, as we saw the next year. Indeed. Well, I, I, I think you know. I don't want to keep you too long, Mac, if you've got other things to do tonight, but I do think we should wrap up after this. I've got a question for him. Nostalgia. Okay, go for it. Just I, from honestly, the final. I got to do, guys. Yeah, I got nothing to do. Anything. All right. <laughs> Just from the final orderly, because if people don't know, coaches, especially the coach of the team playing, see the game very differently than casters, people within the community, fans. Who would be like the Mac? Who is the coach's MVP for the final? Who would you pick? Who do you think was like the key player that was, was the essential one to winning? Uh, I think in terms of, uh, like, if you compare, like, man-to-man -man versus his opposite number, I would okay. say it's probably, hmm, ah, uh, it's so hard. I think the, the biggest difference was probably mid-top for us between, like, like, because Armour, like, I think he had, like, a rough first two games. And then in game three, he just, like, flipped this switch and, and, like, turned it on. And that was, that was really insane. Uh, and then... Aside from that, I think Humanoid was also, like, incredible, right? Like, a lot of what we talked about, about, like, stopping Rogue from blitzing us into the floor in the early game by invading jungle all the time is because he was, like, dominating his mid lane matchup really hard, right? Um, so I think those would probably be the two, the two most likely ones. Believe it or not, in Season 9, when there was Splice and Humanoid first joined, and obviously he was the rookie, and it was all the rest of his team, it's like the experienced players and stuff. That was back when I used to do that show with Veteran Elitist United, and people used to call me the biggest hater, right? Because think about it, we're talking about like the fucking Season 9 team where Fnatic was always in the finals. I always used to say, like even though actually Nemesis was a good player at the time, I always used to say, personally, I always wished like actually Fnatic had taken Humanoid. I always thought that would have been, I mean, you couldn't have known it before it started the LEC, but that actually I think would have been the way better fit, and I think actually would have been a bet. I think they would have actually been able to contest G2 because I always looked at what he did in the Splice team where they played that super like strict style and I was like this guy just doesn't get activated like he can't do it. like the odd times you'd see the flashes he was really skilled you could tell he could be super mega but unfortunately he never got to and then the next year so last year was the one where as we've talked about he sort of had to be the leader and 
if you look at the Champions League players, like you're not going to be able to like fucking CS like a god and chuck all the whole map from early game on. Like that's just unreasonable for a mid laner. So again, maybe he wasn't fully activated this year when he's got the right team around him and he's got other pieces like Elliot. It looks like now this is the real humanoid, mate. Like you're finally seeing the player that people did have like hype around coming into LEC now. And like, the fact that he became a champion first out of that group of players that came in is pretty cool. The group of like Abadagi, Nemesis, Larson. He was the first one to get the LEC title. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good story for him. And I think his evolution as a player and a person has been like really, really, really uh, fascinating and interesting and quite... I heard he was like a little bit of a rager, is that true? Uh, I mean, he, def he's, he definitely gets frustrated, for sure. Okay. He's really direct. Like his communication style is super direct. Like this, like the thing that you are doing right now is either like it's okay or it's bad and you need to stop doing it and you need to do something <laughs> else instead and you need to do it the way that I'm going to tell you. Um, which is really good as a coach, right? Yes. As a coach, I'm, yes. I'm really soft and Marek is, is the like... Right, the, he's the enforcer in a sense that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, been a massive, massive factor in the reason why we as a team have such a strong identity is because I have a really strong enforcer in my team. And this year is probably the year where Marek and I have agreed the most on what, like, the correct way, or at least the way that we want to play League of Legends, right? Um, like, our mid-game philosophy about how we play mid to late game is, like, mostly humanoid. And, like, usually when we get into long discussions about no this is why we should be contesting this wave here and blah 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 it's me and him like backing each other up and saying no this is the way we play the game and that's part of the reason why i think he's had such a profound impact on the rest of his teammates um because they they are forced to play the game in the way that we want to in the identity that, that we have and that makes the game easy right like i think that being a good team is a lot about simplifying the game and having everyone on the same page um and we have a simple structure to follow because he is so like direct about the way that that he believes is correct to play the game um so he's had a big evolution in, on 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 that level uh and i think some of that is also reflected with some of the like different champions that we're playing right like the reason that there were four seraphine no five seraphine bands in the series against rogue is because we'd practice seraphine against them right which is probably not something that Marek would have agreed to do in the past um tf is also a champion that in the past we've had we've like said you know this champion is really strong and he's like yeah i know it's strong but it's not good for us like we can't play this champion because like for example on splice like we need to move the map fast uh and mm. like in that team he wasn't confident enough and he wasn't developed enough and he wasn't like a leader in terms of like you know he was in a team with a bunch of veterans to be able to push like we are going to play the game this way and that's the the style that uh like fits tf right like if we had and he's right if we had played tf in that splice team we would have lost like it would have been really bad but now because we play the game in the way that uh like fits him the best and fits the rest of our players the best right and like our whole roster is built around this idea of this is the way we are going to play the game and we're only going to slot in players that are going to fit in with this identity then suddenly he can play all of these champions and look insane on them right and that's why his his tf is like god tier right now compared to everyone else i think like his his tf is just insane uh, because of the way we move the map as a team with tf and that's mostly on him we haven't touched on uh, the the kind of roster changes that you guys made in the off season, which I find super interesting uh, because I think very few teams would have had the guts to, I mean, obviously your world's run probably affected your decision-making, right? But if, yeah. if you rewind and you say, okay, well, we beat G2 in a best of five with this roster and you guys were having significant competitive success to then take that same roster and you you could have easily said, easily you know this is our first international competition first stage experience for these rookie players we can kind of write it off to nerves or or what have you you could have made very valid you could have re-racked basically just run it yeah. back again yeah. you could have run it back and instead of doing that not only do you ch choose to change players but you change players to armut who obviously had a great playoff run overall if you in in total and el yoya a true rookie jungler who as you said earlier in this show had never actually played on stage ever why would you make these changes to a team that was already competitive with the top teams in Europe? Because it's such a risk, right? It's such a risk uh, for you guys to do this. So to to come back even stronger and then win with that roster is, let's just say, like you put your chips on the table and you won. That's that's very rare to do. The majority all, of orgs would never do this. They would. They would never do it. Sure. And then yes. even if they did do it, they wouldn't have made the right decisions to put them on top. Of they the wouldn't team. scout the right players. Yeah, of course. But you guys did both. So tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it turned out pretty well. It turned out pretty well. As I said before, like, 
like a, a, lot, a lot of the things that go into our scouting process are things that I've kind of mentioned a bit in passing already, right? It's like scouting for the particular niche that you need, for the particular philosophy that you need, for the type of player that you need that fits in with your team's identity, right? And Armour and Elioia were really, really, really clear fits for that. Um, like in terms of being competitive last year with the top teams, we were until we weren't. And that point was basically when teams figured out what I said earlier, which is that we could only play bot side. Um, and they just adapted around us and they stopped us being able to snowball bot lane. Like they picked just like stalling picks on bot lane and wave cleared and then they scaled and then they just spat in our faces and we couldn't do anything because we didn't know how to snowball top side and we didn't know how to snowball through jungle aggressively. Um, so at that point we were just screwed uh, and it happened in both playoffs uh, basically. Um, so to me, that was a really clear sign that the roster was like fundamentally unbalanced um, and that meant that the ceiling was low, right? And like, Yes, we had some competitive success, but the like the whole point of doing this project, like we went to world quarterfinals on 2019 with Splice and then we dismantled the entire roster, right? Like we could have yep. retained that roster. The reason that we didn't do that was because we wanted to beat G2. The reason that we didn't do that was because we wanted to be the best. We didn't want to be a top three team that just goes to Worlds every year, but gets stomped in every playoffs by, by, by G2 and Fnatic. Um, so... Again, like when you have that as your thing, like long term, can we beat G2 with with this roster? Do we have the versatility to be able to do this? The answer was no. Um, and then it became a really But the risk is you get even worse than you did, right? That's that's why I think, yeah. you know, yeah. most orgs would have just been happy saying, all right, we're competitive. Or they would have been delusional and said, yeah, hey, we beat G2 one time. Why can't we do it again? Right. Well, you just but, go, oh, you know, the guys, it was their first worlds for some of them. And, yeah. you know, they tried hard and the scrims went well. So, you know, we're going to try again next year. Like, <clears throat> Cloud Nine for about four years, whatever you know. Fucking, oh, and Reaper might get the draft right after seven years. Like you know, we all know each people love to do that angle. It's very rare people actually do like the hard choice. Because here's the thing: I'll just do what I do. Listen, this is my skill set, mate. They're asking awkward questions that no one else would ask this way. So here's the question for you, Mac. Right? Because the awkward thing is, you did a great job explaining like an overview of all the things that happened from the org. You didn't mention a single fucking player's name that left the team. So magically, we didn't get to find out. So the player I want to know about is this because no one said anything. So there must be something. Basically, as far as I can tell, purely just from like Bloodhound's nose as a journalist, right? The fact that no one ever invokes Shadow's name tells me that it can't just be about what how he played the game, mate. Like, it can't just be that you thought picking Lee Sin isn't that viable. By the way, it isn't. But okay, he was fucking sick on Lee Sin. <laughs> right? It can't just be that. It was sort of implied as far as I can tell. Like, maybe that he had some sort of thing where he wasn't on the same page with the team or maybe something happened at Worlds or some, maybe he was just off the, he was sort of off the reservation a bit. Was there some sort of issue outside of the game with him that, that meant you, you didn't take him? Because I he not only didn't didn't come back on Mad Lies, he's basically disappeared as far as we can tell. So can you give it can you tell us anything on that? I get the sense maybe the full story can't come out. I mean, there are some things that I can't say, but what I will say is that Shadow's identity in terms of the Mad Lions like philosophy and the way they wanted to play was a good fit, right? But in terms okay. of the pieces, the pieces that we had. He certainly looked very good. Needed, I mean, yeah, he was great. And I love Shadow to bits. I think he's a great player. I think he's super talented. I think he's a good teammate. Um, like I'm really sad that he's not on another team now. Um, but for what we needed from the team, like he didn't offer what we needed, right? And what we needed was someone to give the early game leadership and the early game structure, because what I felt as like listening to our comms and watching us get out competed by other really strong teams in the early game was that basically we didn't have the ability to plan ahead sufficiently. Um, and that's not something that was basically anyone's strong suit, right? Like we had a lot of players who were very good at being uh, like decisive in the moment. Uh, and like spotting the plays, but not many players that were good at planning two minutes ahead. And I needed someone right. that was good at planning two minutes ahead. And that's exactly what Yoya did, right? And that's part of why the scouting process was really easy for Yoya, because if that's the only thing I want, then I just go and get the best guy at doing that. And I slot <laughs> him in. And Yoya was the best guy at doing that by far. Like you, we listened to his comms, me and Kazi and Marek listened to a bunch of his his VODs. Like he sent them over to us when we were interviewing him. And like an hour later, Kazi and Marek came back to him. And we're like, yeah, you should probably get this guy. He's 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 really fucking good. Just you know what? I thought I'd tie this in just because before, like actually in the in the few times we've communicated before this show and in the past through like social media and stuff, one of the things we've basically discussed is like, as you know, like I'm a, I'm a very interested in like uh, sports and so coaching is a key part of that and philosophy and stuff. So we had some back and forth. And one of the things we were talking about is we were referencing earlier like NFL and Bill Belichick 
Belichick and stuff. One of the things that people don't know that makes Bill Belichick very unique is the reason why the players he trades for or even drafts are very rarely ever players that even sometimes for his team are like all fucking pro in the NFL is because as far as I can tell, he does what you were describing there. Like he tries to go out and get what he thinks he needs to like put into the puzzle basically. And so he might see something in a player that, that doesn't show up in the stats or they're not the best at the, the primary metrics, but they do exactly what he wants. Maybe it's like some guy who edge rushes in a particular way that'll complement the other rest of the team, right? But actually, if people don't know, a lot of other teams in traditional sports, especially in the ones where you can draft, they actually go the other way. And what you do is, in the offseason, you just try and sign the best player, and then you try and cram him into your team somewhere, and you hope that works. So I know a lot of teams, I think a lot of the LEC teams do that, quite frankly, mate. They just look in the offseason, especially with these rookies, and they go, who was popping off? So if they look and, they, and their results are in here, they go, Tinks has to be the best jungler. 91 for that. I'm just fucking memeing on that one, boys. Or they go, you know, like, forget, whatever the player might be, someone who's smurfing, right? Is it, would you would you agree? Is there, is there a, a contrast in philosophy and how you're doing it at Mad Lions there? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think there are way too many conversations that I like that really disappoint me when I hear other coaches talking about this guy is the best top player or this guy is the best jungler or this guy is a good jungler. Like, yes, he's good, but that's not interesting. Like when it comes to actually building a roster and evaluating a player, like saying he's good is not interesting. Understanding what his specialism is and how that fits into what you already have or what you need is interesting, right? And like, if you, like what you're talking about, Bill Belichick and his recruitment, right? He's recruiting specialists a lot of the time. And if you look at the way that, for example, Fnatic in previous years when they were insane uh, was like, was constructed was that they basically had five specialists on their roster, right? And they had like, for example, Hillisang had like three champions that he was just god tier on. And yes. every game, Hillisang would get Pike or Rakan, and people would be like, "Why did you give Hillisang Pike or Rakan?" It's like, well, <laughs> because it, because you had to brand box Broxes Lee yep. Sin, and you had, had to the draft own, balance that was whatever, nuts, right? wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And There's always something Nemesis's, open. Yes. And you had to ban Nemesis's Corky, and you had to ban Reckless's Tristana, right? Like all of this stuff, like it, they complemented each other in in the perfect way that meant that like you couldn't. You couldn't not give them their best champions because they yes. were also specialized and so good at doing their individual niche, right? And that's why it's much more interesting to have those players than a player who's a 91 on your top trumps card. Yeah, it's it's also it's also that in Belichick's case too, it's not even that it's his starters. It's that he designs the roles of the team. And then that's why the next man up philosophy always works because the Patriots were always less affected by injuries than other teams oh, because, sure. because they just had like three guys deep who all were told to do one thing. Like yes. they had that one specialty. And so if one of them got injured, it wasn't like this guy had to be some sort of God player to come into that position because the, the definition of that role was so clear within the I mean, you know the court, Monty, the court Bill Belichick has. Because another thing I love about him, by the way, is he's just an arsehole. So not, I can relate. You know, if, you, if you're right, you can be. Hey, listen, <laughs> if this show had a fucking tagline, it would be, if you're right, you don't have to be a nice guy. That would be the fucking tagline, wouldn't it? So basically, one of the things I love about Bill Belichick is his line, it really is the line. He says to the player, it's just do your job. You have to understand every other yep. coach goes with what I said before, the media angle. Like, listen, I want you to be the best player you can be in to develop. This guy just goes, listen, motherfucker, do X, only do X. And if I ever see you do Y, you're out. And they're like, but I was a top player in college. He's like, this isn't college. Like, I love that guy, mate. It's like, <laughs> it, it's what every, by the way, it's what every coach wishes they could do. But here's another factor. Like the G2 example, no one else is allowed to do that. He is his own GM and he's the coach and he's won everything. So he gets ultimate green light for everything. So as a result, guess what? If other coaches tried doing his style, if you do that bad for two seasons, you're going to be fucking fired, mate. You are not, and no one else is going to pick you up. So like, you also, I guess, have to like, you have to get a certain status before you can get away with the shit he's doing. Well, the, the, other, the other thing that he does that's so interesting is that he's very famous for like other NFL teams. Like they play music during practice. Like, you know, they're trying to make the players have a good time. Belichick is banned, like all music being played during practice. And just like Gregorian chant only. Yeah. He's just, <laughs> he's just, gr he's just grinding this it out. There. Of silence and, and suffering. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But the reason why he gets away with that is because all the players want to play for the Patriots because yes. they know that they can get championships. So yes. he doesn't have to make it fun for them. He doesn't have to, you know, make any kind. He doesn't have to compete in any capacity whatsoever and so he can just focus directly on the most efficient forms of practice getting right to the core of the issue but a lot of players have said it wasn't fun being on the patriots <laughs> well, i mean so. the the thing that you said about uh like depth of roster is really interesting as well though right like about like specializing players about saying like this is your job this is your role within the team right 
And like, I don't know anything about American football. So like, I, I'm probably going to say something wrong. But no, from what worry. I understand, from what I understand, like special teams, at least until before then, was considered like a kind of like, uh, like a B tier role, right? People and, didn't like, focus like, on it enough. Yeah, they yeah, didn't know. They didn't yeah. know that. Like, so the problem with it is, right, in theory, it shouldn't win or de lose, decide the game. It's not like a major part. But the point is, it could be the little fraction. Like there's many, many times where it, somebody it like, could be the blind kick, pick kick or return and one of the game. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it could be the blind pick Wukong, exactly. right? This is the way that I yeah. see special teams. And uh, like with, if if I remember correctly, like he actually forced all of his star players to like learn special teams, right? And just be like, no, you're gonna you're gonna play special teams. Like, that, mm -hmm. of course you're gonna learn to do that. Like, why would you not do that? Like, <laughs> shut up, go and play special teams. Like, this is your job now. You're like, you throw this ball right now, and you do it a thousand times until you do it perfectly, and you learn every single damn play in this system. But but the reason why that worked for the Patriots, so why star players or or, or like uh, kind of like first teamers don't typically play special teams is because it's a huge injury risk oh, because course. you have two teams like running full tilts directly at each other. Right. It, um, but in a system where you can slot in your second or third teamers, if somebody gets injured, well, all of a sudden. You know, they can't, they can play. There's, there's less of a risk for them playing special teams. So it all like on the Patriots and Belichick, his system, like it all checks out internally, logically. Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. By the way, I'm surprised you don't watch one. more American football. Just I mean, he's from I, England, mate. If you haven't noticed, very what? few British people care about America. <laughs> sure. It's just a natural like resistance. I'll say it myself. <laughs> the big problem is this is because like, basically, if you don't know, the soul of football is the notion that it is an art and not a science. It's not something you can break. Down. I know they actually have done this in the modern day with like the tactics, but in theory in football, it's supposed to be like how G2 season nine played. It's supposed to be free flowing and it's the genius of a player in the moment and not almost organic chemistry. Like, that creates what happens because you don't have set pieces in the same way. You do, there's a concept called set piece in soccer, which is like a free kick or throw in basically. But you don't have like you do in the NFL, like a certain thing. Whereas the problem is, right? So as a result, the way into American football, if you're from like soccer, for example, it, it, there's, there's no there's no crossover in my opinion. The problem is this. What got me into the NFL was when I actually just noticed, where it was actually Richard Lewis who pointed this out. It's like, he said, but, but, but your shit is CSGO and the tactics. So like- yep. That is the NFL. And when yes. I actually realized it, I was like, actually, yeah, why am I looking at like the sporting aspect and the yeah. aesthetic? If I just look at the core concept of what the, what is happening, which is there's an offense trying to you run their playbook strat, and then there's a team trying to read what that might be and adjust accordingly, that is Counter-Strike. So when I realized that, I was actually like, this is actually stupid that I don't follow this. So if you're a coach, <laughs> basically, if you're a coach, if you're a coach and you're from England, yeah, you should love should, the game. It should be That's your shit, point. basically, so, yes. So that, so it's that, the why, ultimate why, coaching why, sport, basically. Why, why I think you'd love it is because the NFL is basically two coaches in a turn-based game against each yeah. other. It's like except, StarCraft. Except it's, it's, like, it's a, it's a turn-based game. So it's like, I, I we're both taking our turn now and we're going to run this play. And not only that, but the coaches, it's, it's like if you were playing chess, right? But my bishop, can move three squares and their bishop can move four squares. So I like have to take that into account, but maybe like my rook is slightly better. So from a from a coaching perspective, it is actually just amazingly satisfying, right? And that's why <laughs> specialized pieces make sense. That's why highly specialized pieces make yes. sense in that in that environment. But I mean, some something that's also really interesting that I really liked from reading about Belichick and the way that he like the system that he implemented in those set piece plays was that he put a lot of emphasis on simplicity, right? They had like, uh, basically they only had like three set piece plays that were super simple to understand, but all of them had like a shit ton of different variations. And that's something that I really, really like about simplifying the game. And that's something that we try to do with League of Legends is to make everything simple so that you boil it down to the base fundamentals and then you adapt from there. And like, if you, if you compare it to chess, like you just did, for example, that's the same as learning uh, what a um, Sicilian defense position looks like, right? Like, and what different positions are from a Sicilian defense position of saying, okay, well, this is how this position works. And this is the position that this can end up in. And in a Sicilian defense, this H pawn is really valuable or whatever it is. That's probably wrong. But like it, it, in this type of position, this is the thing that you look for. These are the triggers. And these are the things that are important in this type of position, structurally, according to the chessboard, yeah. right? And that's it something that I think Belichick implemented that I loved. And you can see, too, the way that he used some of his pieces, because famously, like, I don't know if the Patriots would ever have been as good as they were for as long as they were without 
the arrival of Gronkowski at the tight end position because that rescued their all. That was when they it, weren't it, winning anymore, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it saved their shit in a lot of ways. But to identify that this guy could basically create plays that couldn't be defended because of his individual abilities and then just spamming those plays over and over and over again was brilliant. Right. It's just like he's a physical freak. You can't defend against him. So we're just going to run crossing routes all day, which, by the way, very dangerous for the tight end to get absolutely reamed in the middle of the field. But they, that's probably it's why he was injured so much. But he just kept doing it. He just kept going. Don't know back why out Monty's saying heretical things like it might actually be not that hard to quarterback a team where all you do is throw like small, like 12 or 10 foot passes to a guy who was taller than the person defending him who catches it up here and then just takes it in its first down every time that almost feels like cheating <laughs> never mind never mind what, what would the periods know about that that's not cheating though it's a joke but the point is that's not very hard is it <laughs> but but other it's people would pay but other people wouldn't have designed an entire no, no, exactly. just around people just back then didn't even guy. really people didn't even really respect the tight end position back then so it's right. another example of like identifying something again by the and, way to tie on what max said as well, well before, go, then, before we end that point it could have been even Everyone's worse. I'm so excited about NFL it, right now. It could have been even worse because if Aaron Hernandez hadn't gone and murdered people, then he would have had two tight ends like that for even longer, right? So it could have been even crazier without exterior factors uh, affecting that scenario. But the factor that Max said actually is a really subtle one. I think a lot of people will miss in terms of like coaching and being a leader and like a shot caller in the game, for example, which is this. When people have the rep and the skill set of like, I'm the smart guy, you know how many people were undone by having to be the smartest guy at every moment in the game and having it like it my strategy, I have to show them that I'm the smartest guy and I have to completely outthink this opponent and I have to do the most creative thing and I have to do something they can, you know what wins you actual championships is being the master of the fundamentals. Like if there really is something that's very simple that works. So if you ever watched the fucking Patriots, it was just running a very simple dig route on the middle of the field that was saying, do you just do it again until it, wor it stops working? If it just works, you win the game. At the end, by the way, who gives a fuck if they go, you did something simple. You just take the trophy and walk off. You don't have to continue that conversation. But I've seen so many people in League of Legends, every eSport game, who if they're smart, it's like it's like they almost thought, that's why I gave the example before the role players. Like It's like they think they're in the movie of their life based on a real life, a real life story, but they're fucking in their real life at the time. It's like, why are you guys sexing up the narrative? If you can win by doing something basic and easy, do it. That is the whole essence of these games. It's not about like, the problem is they think it's fucking anime and you have to do like the 7D move on the guy that he didn't expect, but that he did expect. Like everyone wants to have that moment for some reason if they're smart. Like you don't have to validate yourselves that way, guys. If you're smart, be smart and run the obvious thing that works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Simplicity and then creativity is adapting on the fly, right? That's something yes. that we drill a lot on Mad, which I really like. Um, and then you can also be creative in different ways, right? Something, I'm going to screw this up, but definitely I remember reading about uh, them implementing something. Oh, I can't remember the term for it. I'm going to show my lack of knowledge here. Don't worry about like that. It's all about a, the point it relates having, to anyway. Having like an unbalanced line, right? Where they shifted the position of certain players that were normally like never in this place. And their right. opponents are just mm -hmm. confused as fuck being like, why is that guy over there? What's yep. he doing? You're cheating. And they're like, no, we're not. <laughs> like he's just standing over there. You just didn't see him move. Like, screw you. And that's literally like the equivalent of G2 being like, well, we're going to start funneling now. Or European teams being like, we're going to start lane swapping now. And people being like, that's not the way the game's played. Being like, we'll do something about it. Uh, I love that approach. I love it. By the way, <laughs> shout out to all the Americans who are utter plebs listening to this conversation going, since one detail of that isn't how I would characterize it, I know more than all of them. Like, it was about the point in League of Legends, you daft cunts. That's what we were trying to get to via an abstract concept. In this case, a sport that you happen to watch called fucking Hand Egg from your country, you idiots. Yeah, I've also been watching the Whatever. NFL for 30 years. So. Be, to be fair, it might be time to wrap the show when I directly start attacking the fans. I usually just do it you know, inadvertently so, at the beginning so, of the show. So I, I do think we have to talk about MSI a little bit. All right, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then we have to... Right, and then yeah, we, sure. And then we'll, we'll get... We'll, we'll let Mac go, True. and then we'll a a answer some fan questions, Thor, and then we'll be done. So we still got some oh, more forgot. time here. Yeah, my mistake. I forgot about the fan questions. I <laughs> love <laughs> the fan <laughs> questions. Answer <laughs> some so, cunt questions. So, <laughs> so Thorin, Thorin, will, uh, Thorin will then not only directly insult the fans, he will directly insult the most invested fans. Yeah, the ones uh, that are here. <laughs> I'm like a dominatrix in esports. You pay for the pleasure of me stamping on your balls. I'll kick you in the nuts for free, but to stamp on them... That costs 25 grog coins. So <laughs> check out the Discord. Go into the lounge. Click that link in the pinned tweet or whatever. Get them coins and you can ask a question. But anyway, yeah, let's do the MSI segment. I forgot we should definitely do that. We, we call them massive we'll coins be remiss. now. <laughs> All right, MSI. You guys, 
uh, you must surely you must feel a little bit nervous given your, your world's performance and <laughs> and uh, you, uh, three fifths of your roster kind of uh, struggling in that environment. I haven't played many lands either, so yeah, there's a lot of factors that I need. Yeah, so what do you think? Hmm. I mean, I think actually, if you look at like. For example, humanoid and armor. I think people underestimate how experienced those two guys actually are. Actually, I told this story. I'll very quickly tell people. If people don't know, there's a mad piece of trivia about humanoid, which is without going into the whole story, basically, because humanoid comes from one of these countries like in the central part of Europe, where they have a thing where four of them joined together, right? And it was called the V4 region. They actually had a tournament where the like the I think it was the politicians, and I'm gonna say I think it was Hungary. I think it was I, one of those countries. The politician basically paid for a massive esports tournament that was only teams in this region so people don't know this but humanoid has actually won a LAN where the prize money was hundred and fifty thousand dollars it was one of these ones that i think he played against like i can't i can't remember who it was he said he played against some, some of the european names so like some of these players have more LAN experience than people realize is what you're going to get to right because i'm sure obviously armor must have a whole bunch from turkey etc um, armor has a lot but i mean humanoid is someone that like I, I don't think experience really counts for anything with this guy like this this guy has some special source when it comes to going like on uh on offline environments like or just generally performing under pressure like okay. this guy's just like stone cold killer like I, I remember his first game in lec going up against caps and just like not caring and like we've scrimmed with other players right where we've had for example uh like like we have a player that's like hard winning lane against caps and the like he, you're supposed to just win the lane. And Caps just fucking walks forward when he's never supposed to walk forward. And the guy's like, what the fuck is he doing? And then walks backward when he should never walk back. He should just walk forward and just like murder him because like, why is he walking forward at me right now? Uh, but it, but he doesn't, right? And like Caps will take advantages like that. And that's something that always used to really piss me off playing against G2. I remember in one game, we were literally five people in enemy bot side jungle and no one's there. And like there's one guy there and it's perks on fucking lucian and he walks out of the bush and presses w at five people and we run the fuck away like ah <laughs> they're in the jungle run uh, and that's something that you will literally never see humanoid do like after the first game where he plays against caps on stage come off how was it it's just midline get first game against faker again, uh, in worlds comes off stage <laughs> whatever first game against doinby at worlds whatever like he, he just doesn't care uh like i think this guy lives for stage um and i think armor is is much the same like th these two are so insanely confident and i think that 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 confidence breeds confidence in in everyone else right and the way that we uh the way that we like try to train and the way that we try to like uh frame all of our practice is always about making sure that we have the a bit like the confidence to go and make plays and like if it fucks up it fucks up like who cares uh like if we execute it badly i never care like, why would I care if we execute something badly? All I care about is that we, like, do it and then see and learn. And if we can do it in a better situation with, like, better premises, then fine. But, I mean, that's a, a very, very, very long uh, segue oh, get, yeah. into talking yeah. about MSI. But like so. By the way, just to have... quickly say to Monty, you have noticed like his trend when he talks. You can tell he's a coach, right? Because great coaches, what you do is if there's a problem, it's like we've got to really watch what we're doing with our jungle yeah. path. It's like wouldn't that be the jungle? No, no, no. We've got to do. It. If you do that, by the way, people don't get bought hurt. You notice, by the way, he successfully managed to conveniently not mention the identity of the player who got split by caps. Even though, by the way, you can just look on Gamepedia; it's obvious. So <laughs> I like the way you did that, though. It was smooth. You didn't have to flame him, but you made the point. So it's well done. Uh, you you will never guess who that player is because it was a script. Oh, Fair enough. All oh, right, fair enough. I, I assumed um, it was a certain player from like three years ago. But oh, all right, then. No, no. all right. Um, no, no, no. It was. It was not a certain Turkish Belgian mid laner. Um, so those two players, like, they're going to be completely fine. Like, they've they've always been fine in those environments. Joya, I think, is going to be exactly the same. Like, having seen, like, this guy just walks on to like <laughs> play off stage for the first time in his life, picks Volley Bear in first game, and is just like, I'm going to go dive enemy bot lane. Like, screw. I was this very guy. impressed by I'm that. I'm blushing on you. Yeah, like <laughs> this guy doesn't care. Like, I, I've I've told this story a couple times now, but like after the first game against Rogue, where we lost, we were like kind of indecisive. It was like first game back on stage, and we were having some like stage jitters. We like weren't our normal selves. And Joya comes off the stage, and he's like. Guys, why the fuck are we not playing like we're playing in scrims? Like, we would do this play in scrims. Kazi, like, next game, I'm going to pick Volley Bear and I'm going to dive bot lane. Like, just stack the wave and I am diving bot lane, okay? And everyone was just there like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, like, that's, that's not something I worry about realistically. So I, I, I don't think it will be 
as big of an issue. I hope, obviously, there's like meta. I think meta at Last Worlds was like literally the worst possible meta for us that you could ever imagine with that roster. Um, and that can always be the case with this roster again, right? Like it's it's possible. I hope that we're adaptable enough to be able to to be able to change. Um, that doesn't mean that I won't like run drafts down at MSI. Maybe I'm a bit more worried about that than I am about my my players, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I think we'll be fine. I'm not too worried. Like other other Korean teams and Chinese teams, extremely good. Yes, they're really really fucking good. Um, but like, fine, that's great. If like from my perspective, MSI like is kind of a bonus because like when when you come into a split, like you're always thinking like, okay, we can for sure get top three in this region. Like we can get top three and we can make worlds. Like for sure, we can do that. But you're never thinking like, yeah, we're going to go to MSI at the beginning of the split, you know? Especially like, not, not in even... a G2 world and where they've just signed recklessly. Yeah. Even then it looks like maybe, <laughs> maybe not again for this split. Maybe worlds. Yeah, maybe worlds is the goal. Yeah, well, so you're, you're never assuming that you're just going to go to MSI, well, like especially after, like, with, like after you sign a rookie jungler, like that's just like not your expectation, right? So, from I, I don't want to be like disrespectful to the competition and say that like we're not taking it as seriously, but like it's from from the position that we've started from, it's it's a bonus, it's a freebie, right? So it's like just extra experience and extra chance to get good, an extra chance to get smacked around by Asian teams in scrims and then get better. Well, it's also the fact that the expectations you set at worlds are now so low that a top three finish is going to look really good. Right. So <laughs> uh, if, if we make groups, it's perfect. <laughs> even, even if, even if uh, you end up, you know, falling out of the tournament to an, to a Korean or a Chinese team to Dom one or whoever wins the, the LPL final, it's still going to be an upgrade. So how bad could you possibly feel? Right. Exactly. It can't get worse. Like I, I, I cannot int draft any harder than I enter draft against Supermassive in game five at play ins. Like it's not possible. <laughs> so <laughs> also there's a secondary factor as well, which is as you said there, like the scrims alone can be worth their weight in gold. Like think of the extra practice oh, yeah. you get. And this is the part people forget. Because it's not worlds. Well, the Chinese and Koreans can't go, we will only practice one team against one team. They have to play. So at the end of the, if you look at the field, actually you're going to get the scrims no matter what. Whereas everyone knows when you go to Worlds, they still do that Korean shit where it's like, they give you like the one game and then if they smash you super hard, you, then they joke draft to the next game and smash you. And then, and then you don't ever get a game again. And then, you know, you have to like beat them in the tournament before you get like, so everyone knows what a nightmare Worlds can be. It's so, it's so many like negotiating factors. At this tournament, you have to practice all the top teams. The only people to practice. Yeah, yeah, you end up crawling around the hotel lobby. Please, sir, can I have some scrims? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at MSI. I hope. I hope. Uh, no, I, I doubt it will, considering you guys will be uh, one of the top scrim partners for everybody there. Yeah, it's, I, I actually hope that some of the other European teams take advantage of this and don't take a break, sure. because you would think that uh, not participating in the tournament and still being a, a very good team like Rogue or G2 will allow them to pick up some really good scrims as well. Yeah, I, for sure teams will, because the, the end dates for MSI are really, really close to the uh, start of... Yeah, uh, we weirdly close, actually. Yeah, I think it's 22nd of May, and then the summer starts 10th of June, so it, or something yeah. along that line. So it's like, it's really, really, really close. Like, so close that you're, you're like, in most most of the time, you'd almost be boot camping by that point anyway. You know, normally you'd arrive in, mm. in Berlin, like, two weeks before the start of the split. Like, you're basically there, like... Come, Come five days earlier for the summer split, you know, and like you'll get some scrims or maybe not five days, but maybe 10 days earlier for the summer split. And you will get scrims against like top teams, because by that point in the tournament, there's there's going to be no one else left yeah. for the top team to scrim, you know. I think it's a huge advantage for the European region. People never talk about that, how having these international events in a region is also extremely good for all of the other teams that are just existing there. Um, and nobody takes advantage of it too. I mean, obviously it's difficult because of the pandemic, but you would hope that in future years, teams from all over the world would actually just boot camp in the MSI region or whatever, right? Um, because it just gives you access to, to good uh, practice between the seasons. Here's the angle I wanted to ask you about. Actually, one of the last things I want to ask is this, right? So when you look at the group draw, right? Obviously the group draw was done based on region. It wasn't done based on the teams. It's not like a traditional tournament like Cedar. I, I basically, like it was done already, right? Here's what's interesting. A lot of plebs are going to get this wrong because there's two angles to this. One's positive, one's negative. The positive is this. 
mate, you have got far and away the best possible group to win the to have a chance to win the group. Like you don't have the Koreans, you don't have the LPL team in your group. So already it is possible in a way that like for Cloud9 it might not be possible to win the group. The downside for you, and this is how you know it, and actually this isn't actually that terribly seeded as a tournament. You also are in the only group where in theory every team could actually be like what you call a banana skin. It could be a team that could out of nowhere upset you. Like British way the worst team in this group is probably going to be the team from Brazil, I'm guessing. If it's a team from Brazil is the worst team, it's not impossible they can win a best of one, mate. Like that's that's it's yeah. not like having like a Japanese team or something that no one expects to win again. Like I actually think that's the thing with your group. It's got it's like in some ways it's tricky, but the upside is obviously if you play well, you can win the group, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I really like the MSI format. I think it's super cool that you have this like massive like Royal Rumble thing going on with like all of these teams playing each other and then going on to a second second round where all of the teams are playing each other again. Like you have there, there are gonna be so many games which I think is really, really good. Um, I also think that it's insanely hyped that we have Turkey and Brazil in our group. Especially for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially for us as well, right? Because we have our, but like, it, it's, it's insane. The, uh, like, the, the results in that group are going to be, I don't know, like, it's going to be a big deal, I think, like wins versus losses in that group. But yeah, I think, uh, I think it'll be a super interesting tournament for us. For me, I'm, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to like go and, practice more and get better and especially the scrims against asian teams like last year at worlds we got like i think we got like i don't know five five or six scrim sets against like good asian teams uh and like from those scrim sets we probably learned more than we did in like the whole summer split like we improved so much at worlds we never showed it on stage but we improved like in the same <laughs> all right well thanks for all your time mac really appreciate it um good luck at msi uh, we are going to do some fan questions after this. We do have the Discord. You can type exclamation point Discord if you're watching on Twitch. If you are watching a YouTube video, it will be down below. You can still do it. It just won't work. <laughs> yeah, you, you can. I don't know where you type it in the YouTube, but <laughs> it'll, it'll be there. So join it. Uh, we do have the GrogCoin25 channel where we will be pulling questions from. Uh, if you have, if you are a glorious GrogCoin holder, you too can abused by Thor, be abused by Thorne and sometimes me. Uh, also, so next week, We'll be having Nelson on uh, for the LPL finals. Fortunately, I know he also watches all the other regions. So we can also do, a, I think, a pretty cool discussion about MSI, at least yes. from the major regions perspective. So that will be really fun as well. Uh, Mac, I know you couldn't talk too much about uh, LCS because you were, I don't know, busy playing your games and probably having some some beverages uh after you won <laughs> <laughs> i i think if i if i were you i would not have uh heavily watched the lcs series <laughs> so <laughs> i wasn't analyzing it put it that way <laughs> i mean they looked like they were drunk when they were playing anyway so it wouldn't have That's fucking true. mattered as it is <laughs> anyway, you know, so whatever it's it's great entertainment it's great. All I'll say is this morning, I don't give a fuck, mate. I, I'm, at this point in my career, I was high when I watched that series. It didn't affect my enjoyment of the series whatsoever. I still, <laughs> still analyzed it in many ways that I would have had, you know, any other way. In fact, if anything, I can't lie. After game one, I thought, fuck, I'm not even going to wait. Spark now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you uh, go. So thanks for joining us, Mac. Uh, congrats again on your win. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll do the questions from the Discord. All right, this is the moment you've been waiting for where Thorin verbally abuses you for your opinions in our Discord. So, unless the question's good. Unless the, unless the question's good. So Zoom asks, do you think Odo Omne, a moment like losing the finals, will be a growing experience that will set more fire under his will to win? Or will this be like his last moment that he fucked it up and will make him reconsider how long his career has been? I mean, he stuck with it this long without making a final. So I can only assume that he's been one of the most stable and consistent players throughout his entire career. So I mean, I think it's probably really shitty for him, but I don't think he's not going to run it back. He's still going to be one of the best top laners in the European region. I'm not super concerned about his mentality. Are you? No, no, no. Like there's two factors to that one. Like you say, as I said on Twitter, I don't think people understand what a mad outlier Otto Abner is. Like, if you ever do this, right, if a, if a player that's established wins the LEC, just go and look how many splits they played before they won. This guy for sure will have the record. I think it's just like his 13th split or something, Monty. The idea that 13 splits in, you're on a contender team playing some of the best league of your career with a chance that that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, especially people who never won before. Because what happens is like, this, this is how a normal League of Legends career goes. Either you never make it to the top, in which case, 
it doesn't even matter if you retire, or you can make it to the top early like he did. And then you know what? Like every player, you, maybe you don't win in that window. Like HUK was probably the main team where he could have won. It didn't happen for him. What happens then is you either get demotivated that he didn't win when you then go to a worse team. Maybe now you go to the sixth best team, like when he was on Splice. And then now it's just demotivated because like, I played all these years and now I'm not even contending for the title. Now I'm contending for a semi. Or even worse, you hit an individual slump. I think actually maybe when he first joined Schalke, he had a little bit of that. You hit the slump and you go, what's the point? Like, my boy Forgiven. Most players, this is why Forgiven coming back and fucking it up was actually very significant. A lot of great players in Europe could have played longer, but they wouldn't humble themselves and play for a bad team and work their way back up. They wanted to just, like Forgiven, instantly be considered back at the top and get everything their way and have the chance to win. And listen... Chance would be a fine thing, but that's not the way that the world works. So the fact, as you say, that Odo Amne stuck with it this long, listen, he ain't going to give up now when he's just at the fucking point of victory. And secondly, when you're as close as he was to winning this time, dude, if you're a, if you're a guy with, a, in my opinion, a winner's mindset like I think he has, that's what you take from that final. It's not that we lost and that I did these things wrong and I underperformed. What you say is this. Dude, I was playing like shit. Some of the matchups I wasn't necessarily that prepared for. And we still almost won? Fuck I'll take that run back any day. Let me have the summer. If I were him, I'd do that meme of like, I'd be in the server the next day practicing for summer. I'd be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this motherfucker. In fact, I'd even be looking at the fact that I just beat G2 in a best of five series in four games. And then it still went all the way to five games in the final. So like, I'd be, I'd find a way to frame that as like a positive, man. I'd be, I'd be getting ready to try and win MVP and win the whole split next split. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think he's, he's definitely going to be fine. Uh, let's move on. We're gonna get through these somewhat quickly. So Kazia asks, "What's there a lot the big? Of them? How many we uh, do?" There's, there's, there, there's some good ones though. All right. What's the p biggest potential roster move you know of that fell through historically in any esport? This one's fun. Um, I, I mean, think the problem is it logically should be like Asian ones logically for this one because it's probably Faker to China. The biggest, yeah, that'll be one. Faker to China at the end of 2014 when he was actually the only player that stayed is is probably one of the most important ones. Uh, that that was like a superstar at the peak of his powers, um, who also was in a rough situation because SKT didn't make worlds that year. So I think he was probably considering what his he options might have thought were. Of it, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. And they all also offered him probably much more money than he would have made in Korea, um, because that's why all the other players left. So that probably would be the biggest that I'm aware of. Have there been any like blockbuster ones? I've in got the one SK? for you. Uh, on, on, uh, is this for esports? He said any esports. Oh, right. Sorry. I'll do one for League of Legends, though, because it's one that maybe Westerners might not be aware of. So obviously people might know that Jackie Love has been on one of the best Chinese teams for a long time now. He went from IG, where they obviously won Worlds and were in the semis next year. And then after that, he came to Top Esports and was in the semis again, right? What they might not know is that he was never supposed to be on Top Esports. That's why he joined very late in the spring, like with something like, you know, like eight games left in the regular split. And then in the playoffs, it was like a revelation to the team. What he was actually supposed to do in that off season was replace the outgoing Uzi I in fucking RNG. Now, if you know the style of play that Jackie Love has, he always clearly wanted to be Uzi. The irony of Jackie Love is this. He was on a team where he was supposed to be the reckless and he played like he was the Uzi or forgiven. He was on a team where actually, if anything, he was sometimes irresponsible with his ADC, bearing in mind, he was the motherfucking guy with the best solo laners in the world. So here's the irony, right? If he goes to RNG, not only, in my opinion, would it be for a chance for him to truly stake his claim as like, I'm one of the greatest ADCs of all time because the whole team would build, be built around you. But since it's a team that's built their entire ad identity around having a hard carry ADC, that'd be fucking fun to watch. Like, I'd love to see fucking Ming play with this guy. That's exactly, that'd be a dream bottling. So the problem is, listen, Top Esports is still a very good team and they obviously had their chance at well, but I didn't like seeing him play with that fucking shit of support. Like, I want to see this guy. He played with Bao Lan and the fucking, I can't even remember his name. I, the, what even was the name of that support? I can't remember. It's one of those ones with like Chinese Jean or something, so it's hard to say. But what? You, 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 Yanji or something. That's yeah, something yeah, like that. I, yeah, there we I go. don't know exactly. So, my it. problem is, I've always, when a player's like him, I want them to just get a sick support and then let's just turn that bot lane loose. So, that would be a pretty big blockbuster one when you consider like the, it would be an enormous sign in, could have changed the whole fit of the LPL, etc. Aside from that, in League, there aren't that many because unfortunately, in League, a lot of the sexy ones did not. And I'll give you another very brief one though, which is that actually, when I did my reflections interview with Reginald, that's right, I'm a G and I get reflections interviews with motherfuckers who hate me at the beginning, hate me at the end, and in the middle, they have to just give in and do it anyway. That's just how it goes, boys. So, basically, <laughs> When I did my reflect, he said, basically, and this is what, a lot of people still don't know this piece of trivia to this day, Monty. When he got Bjergsen, Bjergsen was the second option. He got Bjergsen because Expecke said no. 
Imagine a world where Expec here goes to TSM <laughs> for season four. That's another game. It, that changes EU completely. But yep. my boy Frog and probably have a lot more titles. Changes fucking TSM a lot more. But by the way, TSM might have been amazing. Imagine if it's Expec instead of Bjergs who joined. So there's a good one. From CSGO, let me think. What was the biggest one in CSGO, if I can think of it? Because the weird thing is, in CSGO, even though now the money's out of control, and as a result, you can't put a lot of these teams together, for many, many years, the players basically were the GMs, so they could actually put together a lot of the teams they wanted. Let me think. What's the one that almost happened? Hmm, There must be a really good one out there if I think it through. Let me think of some of the really great teams. I mean, I'll give you I'll give you one that's just off the top of my head that's like a, maybe a piece of trivia of some of the CSGO fan, which is that Glaive, who obviously now is the in-game leader with the most majors won, he's won four majors and he won the last three in a row and many people acknowledge him like the greatest in-game leader of all time. What people might not know is that because he was actually an exceptional in-game leader at the beginning of CSGO, but then basically had a bunch of attitude problems and some things with his teammates that like made him sort of like, he was kind of exiled and he had to play for like lesser teams in the Danish scene. There was a period in time way before he eventually joined Astralis in 2016, I'm talking two or three years earlier, where they used to have most of the same players that are now in Astralis, but they would always sort of choke and fail in the semis. And one of the things they were thinking of doing was years earlier bringing him into the team as just a gamble. And they just didn't pull the trigger on it at that point in time. So there's another thing that could have changed the whole history of CSGO. If he'd have gone to that team earlier, by the way, it might not even have worked then. Maybe then he was too much of a fuck up and it would have been a terrible move. It's one of those things where, but it certainly would have been a blockbuster. I mean, it'd be an enormous move if you look what it could have done to the game. All right, next. Here's, here's, a, here's a question that has a fun uh, kind of framing to it. You are both sons of Priam defending the city of Troy, which represents esports in this case. You've lost many sons of Troy, but it looks like the city in esports has persevered against the Greeks. It was a Trojan horse that led to the fall of Troy, but what will be the veiled ruin of esports? <laughs> See, here's it... the problem. <laughs> I, I actually wouldn't agree with his characterization. In my opinion, Monty, he's nailed it. This is the fall of Troy, but that's that. It, esports has fallen. Our job now, Monty, like Aeneas, is to set off on a <laughs> quest <laughs> to build a new Troy, Rome, as it were, without all these cunts. So, you know, maybe I just disagree on that. No, what's the premise of what we pick in here? Which character we are or something? Uh, player union. So what is the veiled ruin of esports? Player unions, developers, the Lenovo laptop, Top, or I'll, I'll add something else. Um, I, I, I think it's I think it's inflation of value within the scene. <laughs> I mean, that's bit, yeah. Basically, one of the problems is this. That's kind of connected to developers, though, Monty, because here's the problem. The developer, because they have godlike power, can essentially dictate any of these things. Like, as fucked as it is, the developer can essentially run a planned economy if they want money. They could set a salary cap. They could tell you you can only pay this much. They could they could tell you you can't have a certain... They could do, like, the NBA when they refuse to let the Lakers do a trade with the Pelicans. You could just say no to a trade. In theory, these devs could do anything they wanted. So, in a, in a way, all problems come back to devs because they were the ones that could fix it. The problem is I don't think they're competent to. So, when you say that, the real problem with the inflation goes like this at first you could beat the inflation by just having a better job of scouting and coaching etc but eventually the inflation got to such a level that just everyone had to play the same game and it's a race to the bottom like if you get 30 million dollars versus vc i'm giving an extreme example here and i'm running just a business with a profit and i make a little bit eventually i'm just not going to be able to keep up with signing the players you sign or you can literally play it sort of chicken and say well i'll pay four times more <coughs> no winston and then you just get the player so in, it, the problem with that is it makes everyone have to play a stupid game of gambling, basically. So I agree that that basically fucked almost everything because what it did, unfortunately, for a lot of people might not know this, just before the VC period, there were a bunch of big esports. League of Legends wasn't so much included because at the time the salaries were already fairly high even before franchising. But basically, some of these really big and well-run orgs were actually quite close to profitability. Like they were running them as very good business. There were some very good businessmen, in my opinion, including people like Jack. The problem is when the VC came in, everyone had to start playing this yep. silly game. And it meant that it just put more pressure on every other part of the industry. And so as a result, every problem ultimately does have some monetary factor in it. So that does in a way sort of ruin esports, I have to say. Well, it's also the fact that in developer run esports, they have hidden the developers have hidden information about um what the monetization of esports fans is. So for example, for example, when you want to get drops for an esport, you are connecting your game account to the esport, right? And they can tell if you're on LOL esports how much you're watching, right? And then they see how much you're spending. And that information is 
only they have that information. So they have access to information about revenue that the industry just doesn't, the esports purely, the esports industry, the teams, everybody doesn't get. So it, there's always going to be some weird motive there that is inflating things, but only in the developer sense. Like the developers are the ones I think that ultimately win as a result of all of this. So it's it's weird. It's very weird. I would personally say though, like that's, listen, if we're doing like a macro one, that probably is the biggest factor. Because like I say, it is what, like, listen, you can't say that much, but I'll just say this. M money is basically what ruined out the Flashpoint project I was a part of. If it wasn't for the monetary concerns, there was plenty of those things that we could have done to accomplish our aims. I'd also say like a, a probably a sleeper angle that ruins esports, in my opinion, is uh people wanting to play esports on easy mode and at the moment i would define easy mode as well there's loads of 14 year olds i can get to click a tweet and like it and i can appeal to the lowest common like that's a whack way to do anything in life it might make you successful in the short term but in my opinion when you're in a field that's based on passion it's about excellence you want to do something great you want to do something that endures that has legacy that is prestigious so that's the opposite of doing lowest common denominator low hanging fruit shit for 14 year olds to go lol like that Listen, those people will already be in some way interested. Cater to the people who are the actual hardcore fans. Cater to the people who really like the game and the met and the meta and all watching the professional scene. Don't go for the like basically, it's kind of what I'm trying to do with my career. I'd rather find the 1,000 cool people in the world who totally fuck with me and would like to directly fund me, as opposed to basically convince a mass of unwashed plebs to watch a video long enough to get to a moment where cynically YouTube can promote a spot, uh, a company that's trying to sell everyone in the world a 10 cent widget that does nothing for anyone. There we go. There's my divide sort of self. <laughs> Uh, this is a good question. Uh, one piece of literature you would recommend as an introduction piece for someone that has not read much. I would recommend graphic novels. If you are not somebody who has read much, then- It's very I, easy to read compared to a book. It's probably, very yeah. easy to read. And also, but I wouldn't just read any graphic novel. I would take something like Watchmen from Alan Moore that is really regarded as being a, a masterful piece of literature in its own right. And as you start to understand kind of the symbolism and literary techniques that you know are facilitated by having it be in pictures as well. And I'm not saying that it's a less- like advanced form of literature is a different form of literature, but I think it's also a better gateway form of literature. If we're going with the angle that the guy doesn't really read, basically this is one of the secrets that unfortunately people don't get. And that's why we have this mad world. I can't believe in 2021, there's a divide of like, do you read or not? Like the idea of everyone just doesn't say yes, but then the question is what genre do you read? Like that's the problem. What you need to do is cause people who read tend to then tie. It's like what I said about coaches. They want to tie it to their identity that I am smart. So if you ask them for a book, they're going to recommend like Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. <laughs> I wouldn't start with Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment <laughs> on your first book because you're just going to quit five pages in. What you need to do is find a book that literally, it's not hard to read because it hooks you. And once it hooks you, you're not going to want to put it down and yeah, go to exactly. sleep. You're going to be looking forward <laughs> to getting in bed and reading it. So I'll give you an example. Since you haven't read many books, like Monty, I won't go with something high level. I'll go with something that's even considered a teen book. I would just get the book Ender's Game. It yep, literally manages one. to cater to adult topics and very abstract conceptual, but it's also written for kids. So it's actually very easy to just read and get into. And there's, you don't have to understand everything. There's a simple through line, but there's also as much depth as you want. It's actually a mad underrated book. The problem is if you watch the movie, it ruined it. Like that, yeah, they literally just stripped it bare. It had nothing in it from the book. Like, the book is, has a lot to, to go on for it, yeah. in my opinion. And, it's and one of those ones where I'm not ashamed to say, I think it's one of the best books I've read, and it's a kid's book. You know? Yeah, and, and the best, th like, here's the other thing. Good young adult fiction is still good when you're older. It's still good. It's just a good book, right? So another yeah, one- Yeah, similar like Discworld and all that shit. They're all, yeah. they, they still hold up if you go read them. So another one I would recommend on those lines too, if uh, along, I agree with Ender's Game, but also um, the His Dark Materials, the Philip Pullman books, Golden Compass. Uh, that's another one that I didn't read until I was an adult. And it's about a 1 billion times better than Harry Potter. So <laughs> I would definitely take a look at that. Actually, you know, at the end of the day, it's a book about killing God which I think is super interesting, especially because it's it's designed for young adults. So there you go. Um, 
Oh, I'll give you something as well. Since for graphic novels, I also know there will be a lot of people who'll know the characters from, like, obviously, like, the Marvel movies and stuff. If you want to get an in, people don't know this because no one gives a fuck about comics, but basically the entire swag and sort of vibe of the Marvel universe that people love, the banter and, like, the angle and bringing in newer elements and putting pop culture, that all comes from a run that Mark Miller did, Miller with an A, called The Ultimates, which is basically The Avengers. And he just basically, he created the blueprint for it and he just took for the movie. Movies. It's, not, it's never credited as far as I can tell. So he did, I think, two volumes of that. It's just a two-trade volume. Again, it's all the characters you know. It's exactly what you think. It's like a super team of the Avengers, but it's just very well done with like adult elements. It's quite funny. It's well written. The dialogue's good. It's basically, if you like the Avengers and those Marvel movies, you're going to love it, basically. Uh, okay, we're going to do... So I know there are other questions in the channel, guys, but this has been a really long episode as it is. So we're going to do one last question and we might have to think about We doing can roll it. some over the next one or something. If you want. Yeah, yeah, we'll roll some over the next one. And I'm going to try and take a league specific question because, you know, we'll we'll do more general questions, I think, on Four Horsemen. And we are going to roll out more content. So I think it's probably better to keep the topics either about like books or that kind of stuff instead of like different games. So like general questions or lol, and then we can deal with CSGO questions another time. Um, so Brackthier asks, which I think is a fun one too, uh, what are some league related guests you wish you could have on your show historically at one time or another? Well, uh, it's easy. Cause here's the thing, Monty, when you do this, right. Well, I, always, I normally don't answer questions like this. Typically, if someone says, who would you like to interview? The reason I don't answer is if it was an active player now who potentially could come on, I don't want like my fans constantly messaging that guy, might you on the show? Might go on the show? So I think that's obnoxious. So the obvious people to give Monty is people we just wouldn't have been able to get. Koreans. Reckless, <laughs> Reginald, Faker, fucking Uzi Hive. <laughs> These are obvious people, aren't they? Bjergsen, there you go. Yeah. You know. And I, I think, unfortunately, even if we were to have a translator on the show, the the way that the show works, which is very it wouldn't fast translate paced for, and, in terms and banter, of the vibe, it would be it? really no. boring. It would suck. It really would suck. It that, would I'm be terrible. Because <laughs> so, I've even had those offers before where someone said, like, I could, like, it's like sometimes I had someone, I could get a guy on your show if he wins worlds. And I was like, listen, mate, no offense, but it's not worth it. Like, that's not what shows are about. That's an interview, you know? Yeah. So um, I do think that. What about for you? Who, who, would, who haven't you ever had that you would love to? Uh, well, I think like, I think that getting Bjergsen on is something that we never were able to do, which I think in a historic period of dominance, or even now as a reflection on TSM coach would be pretty interesting. Uh, obviously that, that probably won't, won't happen. Um, but I think that I, I, yeah, I mean, I think there are some other, it's hard because all the, all the players that I would really want on were like Korean or Chinese it's players. It's like Mata, Mad Life, Reaper. Dandy. Yeah, well, the thing about Reaper too is that Reaper's English is now good enough that we could actually invite him on this show, but Yeah, but now be I've just been flaming him for four years. So <laughs> now it's, now it's, like, see, I don't think he gives a fuck. I don't think he gives a fuck, dude. I really don't. He, he's, he's, uh, he's a very aggressive person himself, so I don't think he cares. Um, but we could have Reaper on now. Uh, he's actually still living in, in North America. He lives in Los Angeles still. So that's, that's certainly, uh, an, an option, but yeah, Reaper, like peak Reaper would have been super interesting. Honestly, some of the Korean casters would have been really interesting. Um, you know, um, Templar, Cloud Templar, Dong Jun or whatever. like Kim Dong Jun, like these guys would have been fascinating because they are super good experts at the game. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of the Korean players at their peak, I, Dude, I, you know, low key, I actually think that is actually the sleeper OP it is the casters. Cause if people don't know in Korea, they always have usually two casters at least cause they do the three man setup who literally their whole shit is. They are kind of like the Korean LS now, not in terms of controversy, but I mean, the angle is they try to go super deep on even the meta and how the teams are playing and what correct league of legends is. And so typically those guys sometimes have like super deep knowledge. You wouldn't expect. They're not just commentating the game and saying like, obviously, shit you know like sometimes those guys can go really deep on the game so if we could actually like properly communicate with like some star trek universal translate that'd be amazing of course yeah like i would it, love to talk for example the obvious one would be during the period when all the western teams were finally beating koreans etc i'd love to get those like cloud templar on and ask him why he thought korea was falling apart or whatever like, that would have been a fantastic conversation yep 
So I think those those would be the ones for us. All right, guys, we've been on this stream for like three and a half hours now, so uh, we're we're gonna be done. I'm sorry if we didn't get around to answering your questions. Oh, but it's all right. There, we'll we'll do it in the future. This was a long show because we were talking about finals and and getting kind of deep on stuff. So uh, we'll we'll be back next week again. Nelson will be the guest for LPL. We'll try and leave more room for questions next week because we will have fewer matches to talk about, uh, as it were. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. Follow the channel, obviously. Subscribe to the YouTube, et cetera. You know what to do. We'll see you next week.